Okay. So, wait, where's my... There we go. Okay, so, the reviews for the AMD Ryzen 9 7950X 3D went live today as expected. Uh, interestingly enough, there were no 7900X 3D CPU reviews. So, it seems, according to a lot of the reviewers, AMD only provided the 7950X 3D as a review sample. So, there were no 7900X 3D. Those have to come later. Um, so, those weren't reviewed, which is interesting because I think, uh, as we kind of expected, the 8 core CCD with Vcash kind of scales sort of the way we expected. But it would have been interesting to see how the 6 core 12 thread with Vcash scores. Although I kind of think that it's going to fall like right in line with what we kind of expect. So I'm just going to kind of run through these reviews. So we're going to look at Tech Power Up, we're going to look at Kit Guru, and Guru 3D. It, it went as I thought with disappointing performance. Uh, I don't really think it's disappointing. It's kind of where I thought it was going to end up. So this to me is still like if you're somebody who is building new, like if you're somebody who is on, you know, AM4 or an older Intel platform and you're doing a full new build, this to me still makes sense. Like if you're if you're going to build into a, DD, a DDR5 platform uh, and then moving into Zen 4 or AM5, uh, this does kind of make sense. Like it still makes sense. Uh, and we're going to talk about why that is. I mean, some of this stuff is going to be a repeat of what I talked about with Zen 4's original launch. Um, but what I think is interesting here is the efficiency gain. Uh, this is definitely a lot more efficient than the original Zen 4. Um, and, you know, we're talking like 100 watts less across the board, typical uh, in terms of either the similar uh, production performance and better gaming performance. So it's kind of like where I kind of thought it would end up. Uh, let's take a look. We'll look at tech power up first. So just kind of skip through here. Let's see the architecture. So this is the 3D Vcash. Um, you know, I kept saying 3D Vcash. I mean, this is the reason why, because it, effectively you have cache that's stacked kind of like a block in the middle. So you have the four cores on each side of the CCD. So this whole thing I think is the CCD and then the cores underneath is the CCX. Um, so yeah, Zen 4 CCD has the 32 megabyte on die L3 cache connected via TSV through silicon vias. So silicon vias, that's the interconnects. You can't overclock the CCD with the extra L3 cache and the reviewers were comparing stock performance of the 70. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about overclocking uh, later on. You can overclock these. We'll, we'll talk about how to overclock these. Uh, what's the V stand for? V stands for vertical. It's vertical cache. It's like it's stacked on top of each other. So when we say 3D V cache, 3D in the sense that you now have an X and a Y and then a Z component. You have a height component. So it's 3D vertical cache. I saw review with it overclocked at least on the other. Yeah, no, you can you can overclock these. I, I said in the previous live stream how overclocking will work on the 3D Vcache CPUs. It's it's basically the same as the standard ones. The only difference is you cannot use OC mode. So when we did that live stream talking about how to how to overclock Zen 4, we talked about the two different methods. So one was PBO plus curve optimizer. The other method was the manual mode, which is OC mode. That's what I call it. That's what a lot of people in the XOC crowd calls it too. Um, you can't do OC mode on the 3D Vcache CPUs, just like you couldn't do it with the 5800X 3D. So that hasn't changed. What has changed is you can actually do... Uh, 
precision boost overdrive and curve optimizer so that's what's different so and that's how you'd be able to overclock these and there's another way to overclock them which a lot of people don't really know about uh, using the external clock generator that exists on the Zen 4 die there's a 48 megahertz uh, crystal oscillator that is included on the CPUs this was something that existed on the original Zen 1 CPUs uh, and then they took it away with Zen 2 and Zen 3, and then they brought it back uh, it, with Zen 4. So that's the that's like another way to overclock it, uh, but I don't see a lot of people doing that because that would require... Uh, well, let's just say the problem with using the E-clock to overclock the CPU is it's going to be much, much harder to test for stability, and on top of that, it's going to affect the... It's going to affect more than just the cores. You're going to affect things like the PCIe, the NVMe is going to get affected. You know, a lot of other things can run unstable if you start messing with the E-clock. As far as I know, it's, I haven't really done any E-clock overclocking on Zen 4, but what I can tell you is that it is another method that's out there, uh, but it's going to be one that you don't really see a lot of people utilize. Um, for all those reasons that I just mentioned. So, um, yeah. So we're dealing with an asymmetric chip design. Uh, one standard CCX and one with the V-cache on top. So we already knew all of this. None of that's new. Uh, what is kind of new here is this. So I believe this was in the reviewer's guide uh, in the Word document that AMD had sent out. Uh, but this is in their PowerPoint deck slide that they will, they will probably be showing this next week on their meet the experts webinar that they do i believe it's going to be on thursday for those that want to sign up for that so the yeah they're probably going to present this slide deck next week uh, why they're not doing it this week i have no idea but they're doing it next week so anyway so kind of the thing that was new news to me what i learned from these reviews which i didn't understand or i didn't know that this was going to be a thing i mean i kind of thought it was because i think we saw the rumors uh there is actually a chipset level driver that you need to install which was surprising to me i didn't think that you needed to do this um, but it, it essentially runs in the back it's basically a background task in the operating system that will evaluate how the cores are being used and it's supposed to you know tell windows based off of workload preference like you need to be using the vcache ccx or you need to be using the frequency based or the faster ccd uh depending on you know what the workload is doing now i do think that what we were talking about before with that algorithm for the BIOS level, so the firmware level, that is something that's not related to this. But what I was thinking as I was reading this or like watching reviewers talk about how they had to set this thing up in the operating system, I was wondering like, how is this going to, like, is this going to, to interfere with the BIOS controlled algorithm for selecting which CCD should run the test? See, like, I don't know how that's gonna work. Um, that's the sort of thing that I'd be curious to know. Like if someone were to go, for instance, into the ASUS BIOS and turn on the threshold, you know, like set the threshold to like six or eight instead of four, uh, like does that help or does this thing mess with that or do you really need this thing? So I don't know. There's a lot, kind of a lot of questions in my mind behind this optimizer thing and like is like how effective is it? So we're kind of kind of look at the re the results from these reviews to kind of discuss like does this thing do what it's supposed to do? There's other things too. This file driver that runs uh, essentially the way I understand it when you install when you install the CPU in the system and then you boot up the computer, you're supposed to like install the chipset driver. If you don't install the chipset driver, you essentially don't have access to this thing. And then Windows just treats it as though it were like a regular 16 core 32 thread. So I don't know. Like that that to me is kind of weird. Um, the only reviewer that went and tried to <laughs> run Zen 4 X3D out of the box was Kit Guru. 
I think Leo over at Kit Guru was it was hilarious. Like he he actually did everything wrong on purpose to see what would happen. So he actually didn't install the he he so what he actually did was really interesting. Because I was wondering about this too. So what he did was uh he he installed the CPU in a motherboard that had a BIOS from like September. So, so he had a he had like a, a Gisa 1001H. It was like super old. Like it was super old. Like it was like launch day BIOS from like Zen 4's September launch. So he installed the X3D in that motherboard, which AMD shipped him, by I will add. So AMD's review kit included an Asus Crosshair Hero, which had a BIOS from September. So then he like he was like, okay, it's the wrong BIOS, uh, but I'm just gonna go ahead and run with it and see what happens. So so I guess long story short, he got into Windows with the wrong BIOS. Uh, Windows had no idea that the thing had vCache on one CCD. He went into the device manager and it didn't show. Like it showed two. Like, it showed like nothing. So he thought like, okay, it, it thinks it's like a regular 16 core. And then he ran, he tried to run like some programs, like I think he tried to run like Cinebench or something, and it flat out wouldn't even run. So it gave him like an error message. I think, uh, where is it? Like he, he explains. Further, furthermore, if you stack your dies, you Hold can on, shorten the his, connections. Uh... And this can be a VM provisioning file drivers running. The starting point is in store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, hold on, hold on. So, I'm going to blind everybody with this. But, but this performance is... optimizer is installed. So, he... Hold on. Security go back, running. Go back. The starting point is our new system ready for benchmarking. User guide. I'm going to run through this at some pace because the length of it is extraordinary and the detail is quite eye-watering. The important thing is that we get the 3D... Hold on, hold on. Where's the part where he, like, did it all wrong? Because <laughs> I thought that was the, the coolest thing about this review. This is the only review where they actually, like, set it up completely wrong from the start on purpose just to see what would happen. And what I was amazed at was the fact that you actually could boot into Windows with a BIOS from September with one of these 3D <laughs> vCache CPUs. Uh, I guess it was, like, way back here. I know he showed that. In both cases, the 3D cache model shows potentially significant gains with a handful All right, here, right here. V cache. But what the heck? Okay, yeah, yeah. He tr okay. Here's where he tries to run it, and he gets a he gets like a error message. Which also failed to show the AMD 3D V cache. Yeah, Leo's review is like one of the best ones. He he actually did things what that I never expected any reviewer to do. And I like when that happens because you get to see, you you know, things that could go wrong if a user, you know, doesn't look at any reviews. They just buy the thing and they set it up and they think that they're getting the, the best performance, but they're really not. So Press ahead and try running Cinebench R23, which did not work. So and Cinebench didn't work, Ryzen, and then Ryzen Master wouldn't launch either. Similarly, opening Ryzen Master did not work. I had a word with AMD. Okay, so this is the BIOS that he updated to after he told AMD that it wasn't working. Um, but, like, he knew it wasn't... He knew there was something going to be wrong with it. He just didn't... Uh, he just kind of wanted to see what would happen. So where is the part... There it is. See? Check this out. Look at this BIOS. He's running a BIOS from August? Oh, I thought it was September. He's running a BIOS from August. This is, like, even older. Oh, but it's still a GISA 1001 patch E. So this is still, this is the BIOS that launched with Ryzen, like Zen 4, back in September. Like my first, like when I got my Gigabyte Aorus Master from Micro Center on launch day back in September, like it was on, I think it was on this BIOS. It was either on this one or it was one that was slightly older than this one. Although I think, no, I think it was, it was definitely 1001. I don't know what the patch level was. Like I don't know what SMU level was on there. All I know, it was like some BIOS from August. Or maybe it was like the first week of September. But remember, this thing launched back in like the end of September. It was like September 27th was when Zen 4 first launched. So I was surprised that, look, he, like, even with this old BIOS, the brand string actually shows up. 
Like, it reads... Okay, I guess that makes sense, because you're just going to read... Like, it's just going to do the VDDI, like, the voltage identification definition. The VDID is going to bring up the processor, regardless of what it is. Uh, but if it doesn't actually, like... Like, the thing is, there could be so many things that could go wrong. I was surprised that it actually booted up. Because, remember when Agisa 1004 first came out? Uh, the single CCD CPUs, like the... Or like the 7600X with the dummy die. Like, the, the, the Ryzen 5s and 7s that ship with dummy dies would not post at all. Like, with, on 1004. That was an issue that got fixed. Like, that's why they pulled the 1004 from their websites... Like, very, very early on. Like, in fact, when I did that video about performance bung on Gigabyte, like, that video, I probably should have taken that video down, uh, but I didn't bother to do anything because that whole feature got removed or it's like that BIOS got pulled from the website. So anybody who watched that video that I posted on my channel would not actually be able to find that setting unless they were on that BIOS from, like, early January that got pulled like after like two days after I uploaded that video. So, so that BIOS is back online. They fixed it, but you know, now we're on 1005, uh, which is what you need to be on for these Zen 4 3D things. So it's like. V cache. But what the heck? Opening Ryzen Master did not the new BIOS. There. Okay. So this one's September or February 3rd. 1005 patch A. This is the one that. Uh, you're gonna need to be on, like, if you're gonna be on, like, 3D. But, you know, the good news, the good news about this is that you don't need to worry, like, what this, what this tells me, the really good thing about Leo doing this is this proves that anybody who wants to, like, buy, like, a 3D vCache day one tomorrow and just build from scratch, like, choose a motherboard, choose the RAM, choose the CPU, and just go from there... Like, you don't have to worry about a motherboard from Micro Center that was sitting on the shelf for weeks or whatever. Uh, you don't have to worry about that not working with the CPU before you do the BIOS update. That That's what this tells me. So that's kind of the good news. Because oftentimes when you install a CPU on a motherboard that has a BIOS that's way, way older than when that CPU actually launched, aka the one that Leo tried, uh, it may or may not actually work so the fact that it actually works is surprising so that's good because that means you don't have to worry too much about like having to do a bios update without the cpu basically you don't have to use bios flashback uh you know ahead of time you can just put in the cpu boot into the bios and then do the update you can get the bios regardless of having another access to another pc right yeah yeah, yeah. no i know but i'm saying that you don't even need to do that is what I'm saying is you don't have to do BIOS flashback uh, to update the BIOS before you install the CPU. You can go ahead and install the CPU, post into the BIOS, and then do the update from, you know, uh, QFlash or MFlash or whatever motherboard brand you're using uh, BIOS update tool is inside the, the UEFI. So that's actually really good. Like, that's probably the coolest thing about this entire review from Kit Guru. I think mean, the other thing... I guess we can kind of go through here. Like, what did he find? So, Cinebench Multicore. We already knew this was going to happen. We already knew that uh, 3D cache was going to be a little bit slower because it doesn't clock as high. And we're going to talk about some of the, the default limits on voltages. So, the thing that's different here with uh, the 3D CPUs that everybody needs to understand is this CPU reverts back to being voltage limited the way most CPUs up until Zen 4 and 13th Gen have operated. Meaning, you're going to hit a voltage limit, especially if you're going to try to overclock these, before you hit a thermal limit. Now, that isn't to say that there's no thermal limit, uh, but because they're more restrictive on the voltage this time around, in order to protect the uh, the vCache from degradation, because, you know, it's stacked on top, you don't want to, like, run so much heat through it all the time, you're just going to wear it down, and the reliability of it probably won't be as good. So the reason why uh, they've lowered the thermal limit, or I guess the TJ Maxx is what they call it, 
It's actually not the absolute temperature, but it's the TJ Maxx. It's down to 89 Celsius as opposed to 95 Celsius. Um, that means that you're going to hit power limit before you hit like thermal limit, typically, now, with good cooling. Now, if you have, you know, average cooling, then you're still going to hit like 89C, like before you hit the voltage limit. And that's where Curve Optimizer and PBO come into play. So the performance is insane where it actually matters, brute force, seeing unoptimized game code. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, my takeaway from, like, reading a lot of these reviews is this thing, this is probably the, the fastest, this is definitely the fastest gaming CPU at the lowest power consumption. That's, that's kind of the way I see it. This thing uses way less power. Not only does it use way less power than, like, Intel, it uses significantly less power than, like, the regular Zen 4. It's like, it's like 50 watts, it's something like 50 watts less than, like, a 7950X, and it's like 100 watts less than a 13900K. If we're talking about, like, game for game, application per application comparison, I think he kind of shows that, too, in these results. So, like, okay, here's a temperature. So, here's a temperature. See, this is what I was talking about earlier. So, 75, this thing is running at 75 Celsius versus 95 Celsius on the 7950X. And then if we look at uh, the power, wait, no, this is the blender. Where's the power? Like, the blender, A AMD, this to me isn't surprising at all because we already knew AMD was, like, the fastest one for blender. Or Zen 4 was the fastest one for blender. That's nothing different. That's pretty consistent. Where's the, um, where's the power consumption on here? Uh, this Borderlands. No, here's like here's gaming stuff. But where's the? Is it this? Ada memory bandwidth. We already know that Intel's memory bandwidth has historically been better. And this isn't even anything new, right? Like, this is this has been a thing since, like, Skylake. Uh, where's the power consumption? I think it's uh, here. Is it yeah, here? Okay. So, see, okay, look at this. This is, this is uh, Cinebench power consumption. 151. 151 watts. And this is 10-minute Cinebench R23 NT, so this is multi-thread. So this is fully loading all 32 threads. 151 watts versus 205 watts on the standard Zen 4. And then, like, what's Intel? Like, 250... See, okay. See, this is, this is what I was thinking. I estimated, like, 50 watts less. And why did I say 50 watts less in the live stream, uh, like, last week? Because 120-watt TDP versus 170-watt TDP. That's like a 50 watt difference. So I, in my mind, I said, okay, that means, you know, it's going to use about 50 watts less at full load. Lo and behold, here we go, like 50 watts less on average when you're talking full load. Um, and then we're going to go look at some other reviews to look at like power consumption during gaming. But I'll just tell you, like, it's like really, really low. This thing is like sub 100 watts while gaming. So, so why does this matter? You know, some people are going to be like, oh, I, I, like, who cares about power consumption? Well, you know what? If you, if you are gaming for eight hours a day uh, in the middle of the summer, do you really want 205 watts of heat dumped into your room right next to you constantly? Or would you rather 150? Or I guess, okay, if we're talking gaming, these, these numbers don't apply because it'll be less across the board for all of them. But in general, it's still going to be significantly less. So you'd have less waste heat. Like when, when I'm talking about power consumption, when I, the reason why I get excited about efficiency isn't so much about like the power bill. That is one thing, and that definitely matters depending on where you are in the world. But practically, the amount of waste heat dumped into your room right next to you while you're gaming or doing whatever it is you're doing that is what actually matters that is the tangible benefit of having a more efficient processor so the fact that this thing i think i, I remember like somebody was showing like 70 does he have like the does he have the gaming one than intel cpu temperature no this is the temperature so he didn't do he didn't do like per core i think 
Which is fine, whatever. Like, the point is, this thing is, like, way, way less power than the standard Zen 4. Um, and then, and that means it's going to be way, way less power than, like, the 3900K. And you guys can take it from me, because I have been gaming, I have tested, like, both the standard Zen 4 7950X, which is what we are streaming on right now, and I also have the 1300K. And I can tell you, the reason why I don't stream and use this thing uh, for like live content because you guys who watch my channel typically know that I will do like four hour live streams sometimes over five hours um, and when you stream you're running up the CPU cores and while you're gaming on top of that you're also basically you're stressing the system constantly for all the hours that you're live I can tell you um, that I have streamed with a 1300k um, on occasion you guys can look through the channel if you want to see which ones were 1300k and I know for a fact that the amount of heat in the room, I literally can't stream with the door in the room closed the whole time with this processor because it's too hot. It gets way too hot in the room. And the other thing, I'm using an air cooler with this CPU. I'm not going to use a liquid cooler. I don't need anybody to tell me that I need to use a water cooler for my 1300K. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to use my air cooler, my Noctua forever so and there's a lot of people like me that have that practical uh that practical stance on i don't want to run water through my system because i don't want to worry about a leak i don't want to worry about a pump failure too much high maintenance i don't care i'm just going to stick my fat noctua on there and go and forget about it so that's the reason why uh yeah power efficiency does actually matter to someone like me it's chilling temps are so much better. Yeah, the temps are way better. And the efficiency is like way up there. So to me, like that's kind of one of the biggest things. Because if you're going to live stream for like five hours, you're going to be running your CPU at like a lot of like high utilization the whole time. Right? Especially when you're playing a game and streaming from the same PC. And you guys remember, I am gaming at 4K resolution. And then I'm pumping out to YouTube like 1080p 60 fps constantly so uh yeah that's the reason why the thread count actually matters uh and i w i care about the efficiency because i don't like sitting next to a nuclear reactor while live streaming for five hours see so but a lot of people don't really think about that <sighs> fluids and electronics do not mix that was drummed into my head for years yeah see i'm not gonna go use a liquid cooler now you can do you can do a liquid cooler uh, for benchmarking for world records yeah totally like for world records XOC it I'm not saying that water doesn't have a place I'm just saying for a practical workstation that I use for production that I use day in day out I don't want to be run I don't want to be worrying about like water and the electronics like in close proximity that's all I'm saying. You stream off CPU cores? Uh, no, I stream off of the Radeon 7900XDX. But the thing is, I can stream off of CPU cores if I needed to. And the thing is, you still have to utilize the CPU while you're streaming. It may not be doing the encoding, but it's still running the game. It's still managing all the background tasks. It's still managing all the full upload to the internet. You see what I'm saying? So it's not like the CPU is not loaded, even though you're offloading the encoding to the GPU. Now, the GPU does help because, like, the difference between streaming on the CPU and streaming on the GPU or encoding on the CPU versus encoding on the GPU, that's a significant uh, drop in total CPU utilization. Uh, but when you have a 32-thread CPU like the 59 or the 7950X or the 5950X um, or this X3D CPU, uh, you know there's a lot of headroom there. So so it's it's very capable of being a really good streaming CPU. The X3D is now the best CPU for RPC S3 according to... Yeah, I saw that. We're going to look at that review next. Um, actually, we can go look at it right now. That's kind of where we started. So... Uh, let's look at those re results actually. Let's kind of skip through all this stuff because I think a lot of people already know 
A lot of this I talked about in, we, we've done content on these topics on the channel before. This looks like a messed up slide. Someone's probably gonna have to fix that. Um, so let's see, AM5 platform. The chipset, so like the other thing too is remember, this has a runway of additional CPUs for the exact same motherboard. So, to, so the longevity is there, the upgrade path is there. Even though these CPUs are brand new tomorrow, uh, there, there's still an upgrade path. So uh, let's take a look at some of this stuff. So, so uh, where's that uh, emulation? So emulation, you know, 49, although now granted, it's only what, one FPS more than this. And the reason why the 1300K does so good a lot of people are probably going to wonder, like, why is the 1300K doing better than a... They don't even show it. The, I was going to say Rocket Lake, the 11900K or the 11700K Rocket Lake, because Rocket Lake has AVX 512 and so does Zen 4. Uh, yet, for some reason, the 1300K is doing better than Rocket Lake. Although Rocket Lake's not shown here. Rocket Lake is actually, like somewhere down here it, for some reason it's not benefiting from avx 512 the way it's supposed to so the thing with the emulation is the rpc needs a lot more work in terms of being able to fully leverage avx 512 to get you know like 60 fps or better it's from what i've read the pipeline is there to utilize avx 512 but for some reason it just doesn't really it's either like a windows thing or it's like an os thing where it just defaults to avx2 and then avx2 for some reason with, with the high frequency uh it just does what it does and then with the cache the cache helps that's why you see it doing better than the 7950x in fact it's, it's quite a bit better than the 7950x um which is really really weird because this tells me that AVX 512 is not actually doing anything here. And the only reason why the 3D CPU is doing so good is because of the cache. And the only reason why the 13900K is doing so good is because of all the E cores. Uh, and then with the Switch emulator, it's kind of a similar story. Although here, this one to me looks like the Nintendo Switch emulator actually might have some benefit from different instruction sets although i don't know if i don't know if the switch emulator actually uses avx 512 like this is something that i would need to read up on because i haven't actually done much research at all on the nintendo switch emulator i just know that looking at these results obviously it looks like the 3d cache seems to have some tangible benefit because we're talking like 129, so 130 versus 137. So it's like 7 FPS better because of Vcash. So it's like, but I don't even know because the single CCD one's doing really good too. So really, really weird. If you're doing video editing, I think Intel Quick Sync is kind of a deal breaker. Uh, why do you say that? I've done, uh, for encoding, yeah, like, I've done both. I've tested a QuickSync, and I've tested the Ryzen one. The thing that I'll say about the, you, you have to remember that the Zen 4 CPUs have integrated graphics as well, and you can use HEVC on, uh, the integrated Ryzen if you don't have a GPU. So, like, for example, if you're doing video editing, and you're thinking of using Intel QuickSync? To me, that sounds like you don't have a uh, GPU because if you're if you're doing video editing, you wouldn't use QuickSync. You would use the GPU. Yeah, but you're talking. To, I I don't know what you're talking about. I think I think what you're talking about is CPU encoding via like the cores versus QuickSync, which is a media engine. So I think you're you're a little confused on how it works. So we'll we'll answer that question here. So the way it works, when you do video editing on a CPU, and we're going to assume no GPU. You have no GeForce card, you have no Radeon card. All you have is a CPU. So if you have a Zen CPU, 
the way it works is like this. You have let's say we have a 7950X. And then let's say we have an Intel CPU over here. I, I probably need to save like a paint picture so I don't have to draw these every single time. But essentially these are four cores. These are four more cores. So this is either a, a i7 or an i9. And then you have some E cores here. And then you have some E cores here. So let, let's say we're talking about 32 thread. So 7950X and 13900K because they're both 32 thread. Okay, so when you're saying, you're saying um, you're video editing using quick sync. Okay, so when you're using quick sync, you do realize that when you do quick sync, the cores are not responsible for the rendering, which means you're not using the P cores and you're not using the E cores to benefit from the rendering. They're not doing the work. When you say quick sync, what's actually doing the work is something called a media engine that exists on the integrated graphics processor. It's actually something really, really small down here. It's really, really small. This little thing down here is called quick is called a media encoding engine. That is where QuickSync resides. So when you use QuickSync to render to render a video, whether we're talking AVC, HEVC, or um, you know whatever, uh, it's using the media engine to encode. It's not using the CPU. So when you compare that with using the cores. Yeah, this is gonna be far more efficient in terms of rendering the video. The thing about the Zen 4 CPUs is these also have a media engine in here. So you actually have that media engine on the IO die. So this is the, uh, I don't know, it's not, it's not the 6800M on the desktop, but it's some kind of RDNA 2, uh, I think it's, they call it VCN, Video Codec Next. So this is the thing that's going to do, you know, all the video rendering. So it's essentially the exact same thing. Intel IGP is better than, in what? Like, you, in video rendering? No, it's not. Is the 7950X media encoding engine as good, though? In, in terms of what though? In speed? Are you asking about speed? If you're asking like what it supports, it supports the exact same thing. So you have um, AVC, HEVC. And here you have AVC, HEVC. So basically uh, H264, H265, that's what these two are by the way. Video, edi video editing what? Do you do video editing? Water Paints is wondering what? If he should go Intel or AMD. Oh. Oh, okay. So there's a comment that was earlier on. Okay. I'm building a new PC. I'm having a hard time deciding. Well, okay. Just to kind of answer, was this related to that question? My main goal will be video editing, mostly 4K. I'm looking at 1300K or 750X, and maybe even. So the question, the question from from me is, uh, what like you are going to be using a GPU, right? Because if you're not going to be using a GPU, then I think that the encoding is going to basically be down to what you're actually using. Meaning, so yeah, so if you're gonna be using a GPU, what we're talking about doesn't even matter because you're not even gonna be using these things to render the video anyway. You're gonna be using the GPU to do that. So what, I, what I'm describing here is like, if you wanted to render a video in say DaVinci Resolve using the media engine, which you could do that even if you have a GPU, 
But I'm just telling you, you're better off using the GPU. Because that's going to be a lot better than both of these. So it doesn't really matter, like, which... It doesn't really matter which CPU, if it's... We're talking video editing. So which CPU is best? They're basically the same. I did a video showing how fast they are. But what I didn't show you guys in the video is uh, the fact that that if you have a very long render, this has to slow down because it's overheating. That's what I didn't show. A lot of people said that my, my video comparison wasn't fair because the video render that I did was too short to be a real world representation of an actual video render. I have a, ch I have a, a video on my YouTube channel literally comparing these two processors in DaVinci Resolve rendering. So if you're talking like render speed, they're basically the same. But the thing is, like the longer, the longer your video render is going to be, uh, the Ryzen's probably going to run better because it's not going to heat up as much. What ends up happening here? What 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 ends up happening is the 13900K hits 100 degrees Celsius, and then it has to downclock significantly to stay within um, actual thermal thresholds. Yeah. And the thing is, like, realistically, it doesn't really matter what cooler you use because both of these CPUs, the problem is out of the box. Out of the box, both of these CPUs will actively try to boost as far as they can permanently. Because the motherboard, the motherboards are not enforcing the power limits, especially on the Intel one. That's the reason why the Intel one, and I covered, the, I do a video on how to enable eco mode on the, well, I do an eco mode for both. The eco mode for the 7950X, there's a lot of videos besides my own video that shows how to turn on eco mode on a 7950X, but there's not very many videos showing how to turn on eco mode for a 13900K, which I find kind of strange considering that things like a 300 watt uh, CPU but what will happen is if you enable so okay so we all know like I'll just give you some numbers okay R23 R23 stock on this CPU is like third around like 37,000 to 38,000 like in that range if you power limit Zen 4 the, the 750x if you do eco mode you will drop your score to like 35K. What I show in Intel's video, I show the exact same thing. R23 on this guy, stock is higher. It's more like 38 to almost 40,000. But then if you do eco mode on this, you drop it to 32,000. So that's what I'm saying. Like you can do eco mode regardless. And, and eco mode on this guy is like 105 watt TDP. Eco mode on this guy is like 253 watt for PL2. And it's still, you know, you're dropping a lot. So kind of depends on how you look at it. But the, the, the nice thing is when you do this, when you run them like this, they're never heating up that much. Like this guy's only going to like 70 Celsius and then this guy's going to like 80 Celsius. So the, the temps drop significantly on the exact same cooling. But you are losing rendering performance. You're losing how fast you can render videos when you do that. But you don't have to worry about temperatures. And the power consumption goes down significantly. So um, that is something worth mentioning. But yeah, but both of them in general, like they're both 32 thread. So they're both going to perform very, very similar in stock. And then, but in eco mode is where it gets kind of weird. They, they're still going to perform similar, right? Because 35,000 and 32,000 are still, they're still relatively close. Just like 37 and 38 are kind of close. Well, they're even closer, so. Well, I don't really know about that. I, I wouldn't say whichever you can get cheaper because you have to also factor in the platform. 
you like this that better yeah based off of the temps like i can tell you i have both and what i can tell you is that for rendering most of the time i'm using the 750x but if i was doing something like for example i'll give you an example of where the 1300k is actually better so if you're going to run a lot of virtual machines like if you want to to split your uh like if you just want to run a lot of vms if you're going to do like a home server or a mini server or you're just going to host vms remotely the 1300k is going to be better at doing that because you you can segment the cores you have even though it's 32 thread you know physically you have 16 e cores and 8 p cores so what i like to do with the 1300k is i like to split my e cores into virtual machines so i can do like four e cores per vm as an example um, maybe six core vms um, but four is a nice number because it's 16 so you know i could do like four vms four core per vm that way that's where i like the 1300k i like the 1300k more for like things that you typically don't see in the mainstream um in terms of the use case right like more of like a power user type scenario more so than like video editing content creation that sort of thing i think for for content creation and video editing the 750x is is actually better um like if you're gonna do anything with blender for example the 750x is superior in blender in fact the 750x beats the 3d like it's faster like we just looked at that like a few minutes ago like i thought i had just had it up on the screen like where's his blender this is the cinebench we already knew that but where's blender there's single thread uh was it that one where is it well anyway we'll see we'll look at them again in um i thought it was like somewhere in here actually i just have to look at his written review i guess CPU part three. Okay, maybe part one. Power consumption. Okay, maybe it's someone else. Uh, does tech power up have it? Artificial intelligence, web browser, software, rendering, rendering, Cinebench, Blender. Okay, yeah, see, like Blender, the standard 7950, oh, you know, guys don't see it, hold on. See, like the standard one is 63 versus what, 65 and 66. But the, the reality is they're so close that it's it's kind of a wash corona render 63 because you're saying video editing so i assume you're going to be using what davinci resolve or you're going to be using adobe or something or you're going to be doing something like this like corona blender but these are kind of the things that you'd want to be looking at but even then, you know, like, you got to also take into account the platform itself. Vegas. Okay, I mean, that's like DaVinci Resolve. Yeah. Is the 750... Oh, the 750X media encoding engine is actually really good. What I'll tell you is there was one live stream that I did, and I think we talked about this... Uh, I did a live stream back in January. It wasn't for Spoken. It was Lightning Returns. So the 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 live stream where where I was live streaming using the Intel Arc A770. That was that was using a Ryzen 7 7700X as the CPU. And in that live stream, what I realized after the live stream. I went back into my settings and I found that I wasn't actually using QuickSync on the Arc GPU to encode the live stream. I was actually using the media engine on the 7700X. 
So the whole time, people were watching my stream and they're like, Whoa, it's like really clear. It's got really good quality. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. It's, I mean, it's quick sync. Then I found out later on off stream, and I posted this in my Discord, because um, I, I know, like, I think Joel and I were talking about this. Like, the reality was I was actually streaming using the media engine on the Ryzen CPU instead of Intel's quick sync encoder on the ARC GPU. So, so yeah, the media engine is fine. Like, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between that or the quick sync one. But again, we're talking about, like, video editing with a graphics card, then yeah, like, forget about the CPU media engine, because you aren't actually going to use it. Thank you for the help. They are both great chips, but I like the lower thermals. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, one thing I will... I, I do want to point out, though, just to kind of tie this in with what we're talking about in the review, uh, you have to also keep in mind the platform, though. Um, the 7950X, and regardless of whether you're going with the 7950X or the 13900K, or you're just comparing the two of them, the other thing, too, is you want to look at the platform. And I've said this on multiple live streams. The Zen 4 platform, for the long term, is the better choice in terms of a long-term investment because you're getting the benefit of... Uh, not only are you getting the ability to upgrade the CPU if you wanted to later on, but you're also buying into that ecosystem of that full PCI Gen 5, that longevity, but also really the PCI Gen 5. And a lot of people don't seem to be thinking too much about that. And I, I think it's unfortunate because people are too caught up in, well, who, who wins in gaming? Who wins in power consumption? Who wins in efficiency, etc. right? Like who's, who's got better single thread? Who's got better multi-thread? But they're missing sight of like, when you actually spend money on a platform, you have to think about like, what is it that you're actually buying, right? You know, there, there's these metrics, power efficiency, single thread, multi-thread, but what about the platform, right? Like the motherboard that you're gonna choose, you're gonna be stuck with that motherboard for a number of years, at least. Um, so what I kind of think of and I know not, not everybody thinks this way, but if I'm gonna buy a motherboard, I wanna make sure that that platform has a long amount of benefits. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, like, am I gonna get things like PCI Gen 5? So let's talk about the platform real quick. Cause I know we talked about the these media engines, which are kind of irrelevant because if you're serious about doing video editing, you'd be using a graphics card anyway. Um, but if we're talking the platform, right, like AM5 versus um, LGA1700. This is the other thing, too, that I think a lot of people seem to overlook a lot of times. They overlook this. So, like, what do you get with AM5? Or let's just kind of look at the chipsets. So, X670E versus Z790. So, what do you get? You get... How many PCIe Gen 5 lanes do you get? You get 24 lanes. PCIe Gen 4. You get, I got added up in my head, 12. And then PCIe Gen 3, you get 8. Okay, now let's look at the comparison here. What does LGA... 1700 give us with the latest one z790 because i know uh, i've recommended z690 the thing i will say about z690 for those that are thinking about getting intel uh on the cheap z690 is being discontinued which means after this spring there will only be z790 so pci gen 5 you get 16 16 lanes GPU, I will add these are GPU lanes. That means that you cannot use these with, uh, oh, I didn't want to do that. Let's just type it in a different way. PCI, because if you're someone who's who's investing in one of these platforms for like production, like productivity, not just gaming, um, because here's the thing, in my mind, in my mind, when I think about a high-end PC with high core count, the gaming is always secondary. 
gaming performance to me is always going to be like, not like it's the last place priority, but it's not going to be the top priority, if that makes sense. Because the reality is, regardless of whether we're talking about an AMD Zen 4 or an Intel Raptor Lake or even Alder Lake, you're going to be hard pressed to tell the difference between both platforms in gaming. Like if I showed you a like a video, uh, you know, like if I did a side by side of Intel and AMD, but I did not show you Rivetuner, I did not show you the FPS numbers, and then you guys had to tell me which one was which, I'm pretty sure it'd be very, very hard to it'd basically be like 50-50 coin toss guessing to see which one is which. Like that's the reality of it. So that's that's why in my mind, you know, gaming on either one is sufficient across the board so gen 4 this one i gotta think about so you get four to the cpu and you get uh four to the cpu and i think it's 16 16 lanes of gen 4 and then gen 3 i believe is eight i think that's right hold on that's 32 plus 840 i think there's some I think there's four more. I might be wrong on this. I think this might be 20. I think it's... I think it's 20 lanes, actually. Hold on. This is going to be 36 plus 8, so that's 44. And then this is going to be 6 and 3. So 36 plus 8. 40. I think this is right. I think this is right. I'm gonna guess this is right. I'm pretty sure that's correct. Either I have two, I have four lanes extra, or, or I'm correct on the Intel one. Yeah, compared to a workstation, this isn't that many lanes. What would you use? Why would you use? What would you use that many lanes for? Uh, that's honestly, this is not that many lanes. Neither one of these are that many lanes. Neither one of these are actually that impressive. What's actually impressive is the Gen 5 lanes. This is all that actually really matters. But what I'm going to tell you is there's a caveat. So these lanes, all of the lanes that are Gen 5, CPU lanes. All of the lanes that are Gen 4, chipset lanes. And the same thing with the PCIe 3. These are all chipset lanes. Now, how does that compare with Intel? All 16 lanes, CPU lanes. These are actually GPU lanes, which means these 16 lanes wire directly into the graphics card slot uh, for the Intel one, which means you can't actually run Gen 5 storage uh, natively on Intel without sacrificing graphics card lanes. We'll we'll look at this in depth. We're gonna look at some motherboard block diagrams later to vi to like prove this out because this is this is a, like a real real thing that I think mainstream media never talks about. Okay, so Gen four, these are four four lanes CPU, and the remaining sixteen chipset. And then this one are all chipset. Chipset lanes. That was another consideration. Him on the fence, being able to get more use out of the motherboard for a longer time, but I tend not to upgrade machines for five years. Yeah, so the thing is, uh, yeah, I agree with you too, like on the five year thing. Um, but what I will say, you got to remember though, like even if you're going to keep your platform for five years, if you adopt the, the LGA 1700, the 13900K is basically what you're going to be using for five years. Um, with the AM5, you can go with a 7950X, but then like five years from now, like five years from now, even if this socket is replaced by something newer, there's nothing stopping you five years from now from upgrading to like whatever the best CPU is that that motherboard supports. See, so even if you keep the thing for five years, I mean, case in point, right? Like 5800X3D on AM4. There's a bunch of people that have old, like Zen 1 era motherboards 
that are able to just drop in a 5800X3D. So it's like, you know, uh, there's that option. You just don't have that option with the, the LGA 1700. Um, but the, the main thing, though, that I look at is because what I just said is kind of a secondary benefit, right? That's not really a primary benefit, although it is a, a pretty large benefit when you're talking about, like, the longevity of the platform. But I think, like, this is kind of the thing, right? Like, this is the thing in my mind that makes this stand out. Because what can you do with this? Well, you have 16 lanes to the graphics card. Uh, so you get 16 GPU. And you get 4 for M.2. So you have a, a native Gen 5 NVMe drive. I have a video on the YouTube channel talking about this. I actually have a Gen 5 SSD um, on an X670 motherboard. And then I still have four more. So this 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 one is optional for the motherboard. So it could be like another M.2, or it could be PCIe X4, which is Gen 5 lanes, or it could be, you know, like Thunderbolt 4 or some other thing. Like what I'm saying is you have like a lot of you have a lot of upgrade paths. Or not not upgrade paths. You have a lot of flexibility. More flexibility. With this platform. Yeah. Yeah, what Joey's saying is... Yeah, that's correct. Yes. And that's because you have 24 lanes versus 16. That's... The thing with, the, the thing with this one is all 16 lanes wired directly to that top PCIe slot. So if you want to do Gen 5 in the future... Um, you know, you won't be able to do that without sacrificing lanes on the graphics card. So just to kind of show real quick what I'll do, let's do like a side-by-side -side with two motherboards um, as a comparison here. And I'm going to use the two motherboards that I actually have personally because I know this from my own testing. So let's go ahead and look at, we're going to look at the Gigabyte Z790 Aorus Master, and we're going to look at the Gigabyte X670E Aorus Master. Uh, let's just kind of go to the, I think, specification? No. Um, so just to kind of show both of them, they're very, very similar in appearance. But So they both have the Gen 5 heatsink, this massive, massive heatsink. You can kind of see in this shot like how tall that is for next-generation storage. Um, but realistically, only one of them offers no compromise on the lane allocation. The other one does actually compromise on the lane allocation. So let me just kind of show, let's go to the manual here for the Oris Master. So what I like to do is I like to look at the block diagram and the motherboard layout. Um, and I did this when I was going to buy one of these to make sure, uh, you know, it's going to be able to do what I want it to do without learning the hard way that's like, oh, why is my graphics card only running at X8 lanes? I wonder why that is. So let's take a look at this. So here is the, this is the Z790. You have an M2C underscore CPU up here. You have an M2A underscore CPU. Then you have an MQ or M2QSB. So SB, so, so those who are not familiar with this, M2 stands for M.2 drive. A means it's the first drive wired to the to the either the CPU or the chipset. So in this case, A underscore CPU. This is the first one wired to the CPU. M2 C underscore CPU. This is C. So this is going to be either the third or the second one. I don't see a B anywhere. So I assume this is going to be the third one. There's something else that probably wires to the CPU. But basically, this tells me that I have two M.2 drives that go directly to the CPU, bypassing the chipset. These other ones, M2Q, SB, SB stands for South Bridge. That is nomenclature for what used to be the chipset. Well, it's the chipset. So they used to call it the South Bridge. It used to be something called a North Bridge and a South Bridge. The North Bridge today doesn't really exist on modern systems um, because it was integrated into the CPU. The closest thing you can get to a north bridge is effectively the integrated memory controller, or in the case of AMD, 
the IO die acts a lot like a traditional north bridge, and that's part of the CPU package now. The south bridge, abbreviated SB, stands for the chipset. So the, the SB is going to be the Intel Z790. This is the south bridge. That means that this M.2 and this M.2 wired, and this M.2, because there's three right here, go directly into the chipset. They do not actually go into the CPU, which means there will be some small amount of latency off of those drives running through the, the, the chipset up to the CPU, whereas this one and this one go directly into the CPU, so there is zero latency on like data transfers that route through the CPU and memory. So just something to be aware of. Now on the AMD side, here we have the X670E Aorus Master. So it, it looks very similar. You have M2A underscore CPU and M2B underscore CPU, then M2CSB, so South Bridge, and this one M2D South Bridge. So you have two of them that go to the chipset, and you have two of them that go directly into the CPU, just like on Intel. Um, and what I will say is that M2B and M2A are going to be Gen 5, and M2D and M2C are going to be Gen 4. So now we need to look at the chipset, or let's look at the block diagram. This is, this is the thing that reveals all the secrets. This reveals the secrets of all the, uh, the layouts for the lane allocation. What's the difference between chipset versus CPU? Chipset is the motherboard. The CPU is the actual CPU. So here it is, the AM5 CPU and the AMD chipset. Now here's the thing, an X670 motherboard. X670 has two chipsets. It is a dual chipset design. All X670 motherboards are dual chipset. What is a chipset? It is a B650. So an X670 is literally two B650s daisy chained together via four lanes of PCI Express 4.0 bandwidth uplinked into the CPU. So again, two, every X670 motherboard is two B650 chipsets. So here we go. Let's look at the lanes. So here we're gonna go, we're gonna zoom right in. PCI Gen 5. When I see PCI Gen 5, Remember what I said earlier, the total lane count is 24 lanes. Let's count them. 16 to the graphics card, plus 4 to an M.2 Gen 5 drive. There we go, M2A underscore CPU. This is the primary M.2 drive slot that goes directly into the Zen 4 CPU, bypassing any sort of chipset block. And then we have four more lanes for another Gen 5 drive. 16 plus 4 plus 4, 24 lanes of Gen 5. 24 lanes of Gen 5. Yeah, I'm going over this because you asked the question and you did the super chat, so you're, you're gonna get the full answer. I'm gonna give you the full like breakdown on the Zen 5. We're also gonna look at Intel because those are interested on Intel. It's worth knowing the differences. So, so 5.0, 24 lanes, no compromise, which means I can plug in any graphics card I want, and it has 16 lanes forever, all the time, no resource sharing, no lane sharing, no cutting my bandwidth in half, etc. Full 16 lanes all the time. Here, four lanes all the time, all the time. Now, if I need more storage, oh, and again, okay, here we go. Notice this, HDMI 2.0, DisplayPort 1.4. This is video out using the integrated graphics, the IGP and the Ryzen CPU. So you get HDMI, you get DisplayPort. You also get USB-C with DisplayPort 1.4 alt mode, which means I can literally drive three monitors off of the integrated graphics on the CPU three separate monitors. The other thing too, the onboard audio codec. The onboard audio codec wires directly into the CPU via a USB 2.0 interface. 
and then you get BIOS, you know, and all this stuff right here. And then, of course, the dual channel uh, four DIMMs are all right there. Those are the, like, default JDEC timings, etc. Uh, then you get the, four, the downlink, and here we go. Here's the Gen 4 drive, M2 CSB, PCI Gen 4. So you can run that fancy Samsung or whatever, or that Fire CUDA off of the bus if you want it. It's 4.0. And then here's a SATA. Here's a USB hub. Here's a lot of USB. Here we go. USB Gen 2x2. This is a 20 gig USB. And then on the second chipset, you get, you know, way more USB. Another USB Gen, Gen 2x2. I think this is a front header. Um, and then you have a PCI 4.0 bus and a PCI 3.0 bus. On the 4.0 bus, you get an open four lanes of PCI Gen 4. This is perfect for a Thunderbolt add-in card or an Elgato 4K60 Mark II, or what I personally use, an Avermedia Live Gamer 4K capture card. I use my PlayStation 5 connected into my Avermedia directly into this very PCIe slot, so I can stream PS5 games off of my PC just as though it were part of my PC. So this is what this is used for. And and uh, you need and 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 for the so the question that was brought up earlier, what do you need all these lanes for? Well, you need four lanes in order to run a 4K 60 capture card. If you want to like combine your console with a PC, because you'd be surprised people do that. Any live streamer on Twitch that is serious about streaming and actually has a pretty big channel and has to cover PS5 games if they're exclusive has to have access to something like this just saying and then here you get a final a fourth m.2 drive and it's another gen 4 m.2 drive and then you know you got other stuff here so you get wi-fi 6e you get intel 2.5 gigabit lan you get a switch for an additional pci express x2 so what could this be used for 10 gigabit lan could take two lanes of gen 3 so you could run a 10 gigabit add-in card with this and you get two more SATA ports for a total of six if you weren't going to use this. So, uh, max RAM speed 5200. That is, this is the, the official JDEC speed. Yes. This is the official JDEC speed. Anything beyond 5200 is going to be considered Expo, Overclock, XMP, etc. So, what this is showing, this is the official, like, JDEC uh, profiles, like stock profiles. Yes. So that's what you get with all this stuff. Anyway, so that kind of covers that. But really the main thing is this. This is the thing that's significantly different. Because as you'll see on Intel, um, everything down here is pretty much equivalent. It's when you start looking up here is when things are different. So now let's look at the Intel motherboard for comparison. So now we're going to look at the block diagram on the Intel motherboard because things are going to be significantly different. At least on the CPU side. So... One thing you'll notice, Intel has a single chipset. There's none of this dual chipset stuff. Um, you've got, on the CPU though, here's what's different. So, PCI Express 5.0 bus, like I said earlier, 16 lanes. They all go typically to the graphics card. But on this motherboard in particular, they have a switch. So there's a, a PLX switch on here that will detect if there is uh, a, an SSD inserted in M2C underscore CPU, which is actually the top Gen uh, M.2 drive. So why is this significant? Because, you know, if someone goes to build a PC, they get this motherboard and they see, oh, this is the, C this is the M.2 drive that's the closest to the CPU. Therefore, I should use this one as my boot drive. Well, as soon as they do that, they could plug in a Gen 3 SSD, a Gen 4 SSD, or a Gen 5 SSD. It doesn't matter what SSD. As soon as they plug an M.2 in this slot, that activates the switch. And the switch will then cut the lanes on the graphics card slot down to X8. Which means the GPU will only get 8 lanes. And 4 of the lanes will then be redirected to that M.2 drive... And then four more lanes 
will be left hanging and redirected to an open node, nothing, just open circuit, electrically. For some reason, when I put in, in 5600 gigahertz, it defaulted to 4800 instead of 5200. It's always going to default to the first, to the lowest speed. It's always going to choose the lowest JDEC. Uh, and the reason why it's doing that is because the RAM that you have, um, the reason why it's doing that is because the RAM that you're using probably doesn't have a 5200 profile, but it has a 4800 profile. So it's selecting 4800 because this is, this is a very common JDEC, uh, timing. This is what all the ECC RAM is using. And this is what you'll typically find on DDR5 in the servers and workstations. You will never find like these type of RAM speeds uh, in a enterprise server environment. They're always going to be like 4800 at the at the fastest. This will be like the fastest you'll see in like a data center on that's using DDR5. Uh, that's the reason why it's probably doing that because it has a JDEC profile that maps to 4800. So what what happens is your motherboard just like loads that as a default. It's never going to load like 56 or 52 as a default uh, cold boot, like without anything applied. That's that's standard behavior, it's totally normal. Okay, so, but see, this is what I'm saying. Like, like you lose half of your GPU lanes, which isn't really that bad having said that, but you know, it's it always feels kind of, you know, it just doesn't feel good to, to know that your graphics card's only running at like half, half total capable bandwidth, right? So, mm. And people might say, well, you know, if you have a, a Gen 4, like a 7900 XTX or a 4090 or, or 3090 or whatever, um, it's not really that big of a deal. Well, the thing is, if you're on an older GPU, like for example, if you're on a GTX 1080 Ti, you're, and you put in an M.2, like in this top slot, cause that's like the primary one closest to the CPU. You know, you're running your PCI Gen 3 1080 Ti at like X8. So that never really feels good. It just doesn't feel optimal to do something like that. So realistically, this is a no-go. Like most people will never actually use this. Like they're going to they're gonna plug in their Windows boot drive to M M2 underscore A or M M2A underscore CPU, which is only capable of PCI 4.0, right? Because 16 lanes are Gen 5, and then what's different from Z590, the older ones, is that now you actually have a dedicated drive slot that goes straight into the CPU. So this is kind of new for Intel. Intel typically, traditionally, Intel runs everything off of the chipset, they almost never run anything straight to the CPU. Like, this has been a thing, right? Like, you basically have the CPU, you have a graphics card that plugs in, you have RAM that plugs in, and then you have, like, everything else, your mouse, your keyboard, your every USB peripheral, um, even the onboard audio, all of this stuff plugs into the chipset. And then the chipset will plug in to the CPU. So, like, literally the only thing that plugs into the Intel CPU natively is the graphics card, the one M.2 drive, and, you know, obviously there's an integrated graphics in here, uh, so you get one monitor out for just in case you need to troubleshoot or you don't have a graphics card or something. So you can run one monitor, right, versus, like, three monitors on the AMD. One, two, three. Now, granted, this could be up to the motherboard manufacturer to to decide, you know, how many display outs they want off of the integrated graphics. But, you know, the Intel one on this particular one, and remember, these two motherboards are the exact same motherboard. We're talking about the Aorus Master. These are like really high-end $500 motherboards that we're talking about. And this one has a single display port. Um, and then you get like one Gen 4 drive, and then you have that. So that's the limit of few lanes. Yeah. So that, that's the thing. So now, now where do you make that up? Well, you make it up in the chipset because the chipset's giving you, what is this? 
4, 8, 12, 12 PCI 4 lanes, um, and then you add those CPU 4 lanes. So that's, that's where I got my 16 PCI 4 lanes. That's where I got the number 16. Um, and then you have 3.0 for uh, Thunderbolt add-in or capture card like Avermedia or Elgato. And then if you're doing like the legacy ones that can only do up to 1080p 60, that would be off of this one for one lane. Um, but you know, like look at the difference here. We have PCI Express 3, X4 and 1 versus PCI 4, X4 and then another M.2 X4. So it's like, okay, you got you got another one over here on the Gen 3 bus, but it's like, eh, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just think when I look at the platform, and I've done a lot of, like, motherboard analysis and breakdowns just to compare platforms, and I kind of think, you know, like, the AMD one just straight up offers better value. A lot of people complain about the AMD motherboards being so expensive. Um, honestly, the only reason why that is is because of all the Gen 5. That's literally the reason why. Um, and the, the funny thing is this, the Oris Master Z790 is a $500 motherboard. The AMD one is also a $500 motherboard. So they're the exact same price. Now, now as you go further up the stack, the AMD ones end up costing more because, you know, Asus and MSI like to tax, you know, all that Gen 5 and profit off of that. So that's kind of why it's like that. For some reason when you put, yeah. That's the limits of few lanes on the Ace. You can run three Gen five M.2. Yeah, so the, the Ace is insanely good, but it, but it is a seven hundred dollar motherboard. <laughs> it's a seven hundred dollar motherboard, but if you if you're like if okay, I'll say this: if you're a power user wanting to do content creation and you're trying to figure out how much like fast dense storage you can get, the MSI Ace is probably the best option. As long as you don't need, um, as long as you don't need Thunderbolt, that's like the one thing that MSI doesn't have on AMD. Whereas Gigabyte, ASRock, and ASUS all offer Thunderbolt connectivity, which is supposed to be an Intel technology, and it is an Intel technology. Intel developed it um, per Apple's specifications. Uh, you can actually do Thunderbolt on an AMD motherboard. So here's the Intel one. Z790 Aorus Master. And there it is down there. The Thunderbolt C1 header. There it is, that 5-pin header. And then on the AMD one, if you go back up here, there it is. Thunderbolt U4 right there. Thunderbolt on AMD. You can do it too. Most people in gamers will never care about Gen 5 NVMe. Well, I mean, the thing is, you, you, you can't always just look at it from today, right? Like, if we talked about this, if, if we were talking about Gen 4 back in, like, 2019 was when it first came out, like, the same argument would have been made. Most gamers won't care about Gen 4. You know, like, back in 2019, when the only Gen 4 option was you know, Zen 2, Ryzen 3000. Oh, we got another super chat. Super googly. Hi guys, can you recommend a board with the most number of M.2 lanes without compromising PCIe lane down to X8? Anything except godlike is within my budget. We were just talking about that. <laughs> so that's a great, great question. Um, here's the thing. I'll, I'll summarize it for you and then we'll look at some other boards. So, Hold on, let me bring up paint. So, okay, here's the thing. If it, it's two things. If you need Thunderbolt 4 with PCIe tunneling, then your options are going to be Asus F, uh not MSI, Gigabyte Gigabyte or ASRock. Those are going to be your options. If you don't need Thunderbolt 4, then the best motherboard is the MSI. I think it's called the MSI X670E. Or no, the MSI Meg. Meg X670E Ace. 
This is like the best. This is literally the best motherboard. Hands down. Of this entire generation. Like straight up the best. But if you need Thunderbolt 4. Thunderbolt 4. The lack of Thunderbolt 4 on the Ace is the Achilles heel. It is the biggest weakness of the Ace. But if you don't need Thunderbolt 4, this is the best motherboard. Like, hands down. Azrock's not that bad. I will say Azrock tends to be the most innovative of all four of them. Well, okay, Asus is also innovative in in previous years. Not so much recently. Asus has, Asus has gone way too heavy on, like, RGB and the whole gamer look. That I feel like Azrock actually is the one that seems to be doing more, like, innovative things. You still don't need a Gen 4. Well, I mean, that's debatable. <laughs> that's debatable. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see how we'll see how that statement ages in the next couple of years. But yeah, I mean, for everyday usage, Gen 3 SSDs are fine. I mean, I, I myself have a bunch of Gen 3 SSDs, right? I literally only have like one Gen 4 SSD or Gen 5 SSD. And my only Gen 4 SSD is in the PlayStation 5, so. Um, hold on. So, did I answer the question? We'll, we'll look at the motherboards. We'll look at the motherboards. We'll look at more block diagrams. Azrock and Asus are the worst motherboards. How so they're fine? See, it's hard for me to, to like, say one is better over the other when I... I... I, I, I've never had anything really bad happen with any motherboard that I've ever owned. So it's hard for me to say, like, okay, one is way better than the other. Or, or so. You're using C1 on HDMI 2.1? Yeah. Well, I was just... I'm just pointing it out. I'm just pointing it out, right? Because, because you asked, and I, I do want to tell you any sort of, uh, like, gotchas or limitations to look out for. So for gaming, then yeah, the MSI Ace is gonna be the best one. But uh, but you're saying with the most number of M.2s without compromise, yeah. So pretty much the Ace. Um, but the thing is with the Ace, in order to leverage the most storage, uh, well, it it gives you the most options because it gives you an expander card. But if you aren't gonna do the expander card, then realistically. MSI. Let's look at the manual on this guy. This is the X670. Oh, whoops. This is X670 Aorus. Or, not Aorus, Ace. Let's go to find the uh, block diagram. It's hidden away. They, they hit it like all the way at the bottom somewhere. There it is. Okay, this is the Ace. So, the cool thing about the Ace is the Ace gives you the traditional X8. Uh, the, the, so, you have the X16, but then if you want, like, dual GPU or you want to plug in, like, two M.2 drives, um, there is the option to do that, but you don't really need to do that. You can use this uh, open slot down here. So, there's three of them. Uh, if we go back to the diagram... Well, let's go find the uh, overview. So, one well, thing about the Ace, so you get X16 PCI Gen 5 on the top slot. That's typically where the graphics card is going to go. Then this middle slot is the one that you typically won't use because if you plug anything into the second slot, that's going to take half of the lanes from the graphics card slot and run eight of them down here. So you'll end up with eight up here and eight down here. So you, typically you won't really use this one. But this bottom one, what makes the Ace so interesting is this bottom slot down here gives you four lanes of Gen 5 uh, PCIe expansion. So you could run an M.2 in there. You could run um, you know, a capture card in there or whatever. Um, anything like that. Eventually, I'm guessing, someday, 
there will be like an 8K or like a capture card that can do 8K or a capture card that can do 4K 120 or maybe 4K 240. Like when those capture cards come out, this slot down here is going to be perfect for that use case because it's four lanes of Gen 5. One of the reasons why the Ace is so expensive is because in order for them to run this bottom slot at 5.0 speed, they have an insane amount. There's so many uh, redrivers and signal regenerators um, to cancel out noise and parasitic losses on the electrical signaling down from the CPU all the way down to this guy over here. So that's the reason why. Because remember, this, this X4 slot is wired directly into the CPU. There is no chipset that connects to this bottom slot. It has to go all the way to the CPU by itself. So it needs a lot of signal regenerators in order for it to maintain that, that level of signal integrity for that speed. Is, could do virtualization pass through yeah that's a really good question unfortunately i don't have the motherboard so i can't i can't comment on like uh like fr like things like sriov um any kind of virtualization workload i, I can't comment on it because i don't have it but it's it's got all the things that you need typically you know six sata ports uh you get the the postcode debug led over here you have a Gen 5 drive slot right here with a big heat sink. Um, the nice thing about this one is it's off to the side over here. So it's not like stuck right next to the CPU. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then you have the dual chipset. And you have like what? Three more M.2 drive slots here. I think we open this up. You get, yeah, one native here. And then you have this open slot. So that means the rest of them are going to be Gen 4. So you have a Gen 4 right here off of the first chipset. And then you have two more uh, Gen 4 off of the second chipset. So very interesting things that they do here. So they have uh, two SATA off the primary, the P3 and P4. This stands for primary 3 and primary 4. Primary meaning the first primary chipset. And this is S3, S4 secondary chipset. And these that are labeled A... Uh, indicate that they are traveling through an Asmedia 1061 splitter which takes a single PCI Gen 3 lane and splits that out so you can run two SATA drives off of one single PCI Gen 3 lane. Typically uh, one Gen 3 lane equates to one SATA drive. Couldn't you run PCI expanders in an X? Yeah, if, if, if something like that existed. You could, I mean, I, I don't know of any any splitters or expanders natively that you could purchase that can split out, that can fan out the lanes like that, that exists in the market today. If anything, ATX needs to die. The cards are mounted upside down. Oh, yeah. Well, then they're going to have to redo like how they do the logos and stuff on all those cards. So, so the, the cool thing is you have a lot of expandability. That's what I'm saying. So it's like, oftentimes this is overlooked. And I feel like the general mainstream media uh, on the tech crowd and the gaming crowd, oftentimes they don't really talk too much about the platform itself, which is a little disappointing because you don't get that much. Like oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll see YouTube videos that talk about the performance, which is nice, but there's so many videos talking about the performance. At, at, one, at some point, it's, it's redundant. The other thing cool about the Ace that I'll point out real quick, it does have a 10 gigabit LAN natively on the, the motherboard. So you get 10 gigabit LAN. That's you, typically, that uses up two lanes of Gen 4. Oh, well, actually, no, it's using two lanes of Gen 3. Yeah, yeah, it's two lanes of Gen 3 to, to achieve 10 gigabit networking.
You have eyes on the 6000 C30 64 gig expo from Trident. Yeah, so I can tell you what I'm running. So I'm running, um, well, let me bring up CPU Z. I'm running similar RAM. It's cast latency 30. I've tuned mine, per, like I've tuned it, um, but I'm not running, I'm not running like 6,000, although I do kind of want to run 6,000. So let me bring, where is it at? Here it is. This is gonna be too small to make it larger. Whoops. Wait, hold on, move it on top of this guy. Okay. So here's the CPU Z. Um, let me make it larger, I guess. The memory is right here. So I'm running 5600 megahertz RAM. So not quite as fast as 6,000. I haven't bothered to try to overclock mine to 6,000, but you can see I'm running 64 gigabytes um, at 5,600 with the 30, 36, 36, 68, 60. So I, I have timed, I have tuned these manually, but the SPD, the stock Expo XMP profile is 30, 36, 36, 89. So you can tell this is SK Hynix. And what I will recommend is definitely if you're going to buy DDR5, especially if you want to run 64 gigabytes like me. Uh, I was, for a while, I was running 128 gigabytes. Um, I have since taken two, I was running four DIMMs of 128 at 5200 megahertz. I, I'm probably going to try overclocking my RAM to 6000 and do another content piece on that in the future. So that's the reason why I've backed it back down to two DIMMs so I can run the RAM at higher speeds. So, because typically when you're running four sticks of dual rank, because when we're talking 64 gigs, that means this is 32 gigabytes per DIMM. That is a dual rank DIMM that is much harder to run at high speeds than a single rank DIMM. Typically, when you guys see like a lot of people talking about running RAM at, you know, like 6400 or 7200 or some really, really high speed on an Intel platform, they're really only able to do that with 32 gigabytes of memory. Um, they can possibly do that with 64 gigs using four sticks of RAM because those are four sticks of single rank DIMMs. But if we're talking, you know, dual rank DIMMs, that's going to be significantly harder on the memory controller. So uh, if you are looking for productivity as opposed to like just gaming, uh, then, you know, the density of the RAM is probably more important than the, the speed of the RAM. Which is a cheaper ACE alternative for gaming? Uh, typically, anything that's going to be... B, you could go B650E. We didn't really talk much about B650E. Uh, just know the only difference between X670 and B650 is, like I said, X670 has dual chipset. You get two chipsets with X670. Whereas with B650, you only get one chipset. We'll look at some B650 motherboards next. How about that? We'll do that. What kit is Joey running? Joey's running 6,000. Okay, yeah, the Trident Z. Yeah. That's Hynix. 30, 40, that's Hynix. Yeah, I can, tell, I can tell just by looking at it, it's Hynix. So that's the good stuff. Most gamers don't need two chipsets. Right, that's what we're going to talk about B650. If we're talking about gaming, B650 and B650E is where the value is. Um, I'm just saying for content creation, for productivity, for for like a, a prosumer workstation on a budget, because when we say workstation, workstation oftentimes has a connotation of being really, really expensive high-end hardware, aka Threadripper Pro. Um, but if you, if, you're, if you want to use your computer for work or productivity not just gaming and you don't want to spend you know several thousand dollars on a workstation you can build a workstation with an x670e and do relatively well in terms of the connectivity that it provides so
You got the Gigabyte B650E Aorus Master, but that motherboard has QC issue. It can't handle AVX or very... Are you sure? Well, I don't know. Um, I have... I have not run into issues on the X670, and I'm using X670 Aorus Master. For those wondering what motherboard I'm using, you can see right here. Gigabyte Technology X670E Aorus Master with PCI Express 5.0, the Ryzen SoC, etc. The BIOS is whatever the latest one is. This is the one that supports the 3D vCache CPUs. And the graphics card, the graphics card, so the bus is 5.0, but the graphics card that I'm using only does 4.0, so it's going to always choose the lowest common denominator. Oh, only B650E or Master has it? Okay, so let's look at uh, let's look at the the B650 though. So um, one of the ones that's pretty good is Asrock Steel Legend. So this one's pretty good. The Asrock Steel Legend. The cool thing about the Asrock is this one includes well for some reason when i zoom in it doesn't actually zoom in on the picture this one includes an interesting little gpu bracket thing like an anti-sag bracket with the motherboard so that's really nice yeah so there are there are some motherboards that natively include thunderbolt uh, if you need Thunderbolt, I can just give you a quick rundown of the list of motherboards that have Thunderbolt. Uh, I'll have to bring back up the paint. Oh, now it's too big because I zoomed in. Hold on, I gotta fix it. Uh, there's, there's, I think, four, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe five. So the Thunderbolt 4, if you need Thunderbolt 4 and you don't want to buy an add-in card, uh, the way you can get Thunderbolt is ASRock, ASRock Tai Chi X670E Tai Chi, ASRock B650E Tai Chi also includes Thunderbolt, and then ASUS Crosshair uh, Extreme. Well, or I guess Asus X670E Crosshair Extreme. This includes Thunderbolt. The Hero also includes Thunderbolt. And the Asus Pro Art Creator includes Thunderbolt. So these are the these are the five that I know. I'm trying to remember if there's another B650. I'm pretty sure the Tai Chi from ASRock, the B650E. So this is the, for, for those who are wondering, this is the 40 gig USB C, USB 4, aka 40 gig uh, Thunderbolt 4. These are the motherboards that include that natively, for those wondering. The other options will be an add in card. For Gigabyte motherboards, ASRock motherboards, and I believe ASUS also does have a uh, Thunderbolt 4 add-in card. But you wouldn't use that with any of these because these already have the connector. You, you would use that with like, okay, if you want to add Thunderbolt or Thunderbolt. So if you want to add them, you have a lot of options, like a lot of options. So ASRock, ASRock Steel Legend, uh, both the X670E and I think the B650E, although we'll have to look. Um, the Gigabyte, actually, you know, ASRock, I think the ASRock uh, PG Riptide might also, maybe... 
I, I have to look. I, I have to check if that if that can do Thunderbolt via an add-in card. But then Gigabyte, there's a lot. So Gigabyte has like X670, Extreme, Master, AX, Elite. All of those support the Thunderbolt add-in card. And then also the, the B650... B650E Master, and then I think the uh, the B650AX I think also can do can do Thunderbolt via an add-in card, and then I think for uh, Asus Asus has the option for Strix X670E Strix dash E. This has an add-in option. I think there's probably a few others. From Asus, I think the I don't know about the Prime, but I know the Strix can add Thunderbolt. And then who am I leaving? Oh, MSI doesn't have Thunderbolt, so they're the only one that doesn't have it. You get a lot with the Crater motherboard for the money. The classic dilemma is: is that better to upgrade incrementally every gen, or go for the top end and only upgrade a couple of gen? Asus Pro Art B series is pretty cool if you don't mind giving up PCI Gen 5. Um, it, is it a B650? Are you talking about Asus Pro Art B? Is it B650 or B650E? Because if it's B650E, you're not giving up any Gen 5. And if it's B650, you typically still have four lanes of Gen 5 for an SSD. Hold on, what? there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, graphic design world records. You don't mind spending a bit more on the board if it can carry me through three gens of AM5. That's the, that's exactly my same opinion there. I agree with uh, Super Google on the uh, on the choice of motherboard. You were looking okay. Uh, so the the thing about the Asus Pro Art B is that a B six fifty E or a B six fifty? Let's see. Let me see. Oh, it's a B six fifty. I found it. So yeah, let's look at this. Yeah, so this one, this one actually has a, th the, yeah, it's got the Thunderbolt. So, th okay, so there's a B650 Asus that has the Thunderbolt. So, Pro Art Creator X670E and B650, they both have Thunderbolt included. And then these are going to be add-in, like optional, if you wanted to add Thunderbolt. But I think for like a gaming PC, yeah, Thunderbolt's not really needed. But for a production, it might be needed for like storage, like external storage and things. And also DisplayPort input. But not all, but the thing is, like not every one of these can do DisplayPort input. The ones that include Thunderbolt. Only the Asus ProArt Creator has DisplayPort input. These other ones up here uh, do not have DisplayPort input. Instead, what they do is they take the what would have been the DisplayPort input and they wire it directly to a one of the integrated graphics display outs. One question you would know about this. The MSI carbon is lower than all the AM5. No, it should that shouldn't affect it. No, because because the signaling so the motherboard manufacturer, in this case MSI, they they should have accounted for that in their design when they did the PCB design. So it should be the same as all the others. Talking about world record. Yeah, see the thing is it's 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 such a small difference that it's not gonna make any difference. For everyday usage, it's never—it's not gonna make a difference. 
I know what Joey's saying because technically it being further away means it needs more like retimers and regenerators, but realistically they would have to include that in the design. So they would have allocated a regen if they needed it. But I don't I don't think the distance is that much. Yeah, I don't think it's you're you're not going to notice it. Yeah, the MSI carbon Wi-Fi is actually really good. Yeah. I will say that out of all of these, the Gigabyte Aorus Master that I have, the X670E, this has been a surprisingly good motherboard. Like, it's, it's a really good motherboard. It's in the same price range as the MSI X670E Carbon Wi-Fi. But it is a larger motherboard, so it's an EATX motherboard, kind of like the Ace. Um, but it's $200 cheaper than the Ace. It doesn't have the expander card that the Ace comes with. Uh, but it does give you the option to add Thunderbolt via an add-in card. So, um, it's what's, what's fascinating is how different all, a lot of these motherboards are. The thing with the AM5 motherboards, is they're so different depending on what brand you're looking at. That it's very hard to do like a direct comparison. Because some of them have Thunderbolt. Some don't. Some have it built in. Others don't. You have to add it in as a card. You know like it's all over the place. How stupid of Gigabyte not having a CMOS button or accessible battery. Yeah that, that is. Yeah I'll agree with you there. That is one thing on the Master. Like the Master for some reason doesn't have the clear CMOS button on the back. But the Extreme does. And what's funny is the B650 Aorus Master does have the clear CMOS on the back, whereas the Master, the X671 doesn't for some reason. Like, that's that's definitely an oversight on Gigabyte's design team. It's definitely a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Because it's because only the master, only the X seventy master doesn't have that. If you look at the extreme, the extreme has it. The B six fifty E master has it, um, but for some reason the or the X six seventy E master does not have it. Yeah, the Z seven ninety one does have it. So like I said, yeah, for some reason they just like completely forgot about it on the master. For some reason, I don't know why. Like it's not that they couldn't fit it because if you look on the the web page. It clearly shows that it had enough room. Let me find the... Uh... Yeah, this is... This is kind of uh, weird that it doesn't have it. See? So the Aorus Master, for some reason, it's got, it's got the BIOS flashback button... But it doesn't have a clear CMOS button. But on the uh, the other one, it does have it. And I was looking at the Creator earlier. The Creator B650 does have DisplayPort input. And I think on the on the B650, the B650 Aorus Master uh, does have it. Yeah, see? For some reason, the cheaper one has it, but the more expensive one doesn't. But then when you go up to, like, the flagship, the Extreme, the Extreme does have it. So, yeah, kind of weird. Really, really weird. Huge oversight there on, on like, a super high-end motherboard to not include that. The Pro Art. Yeah, the Pro Art. This is a really nice motherboard. Uh, I, one thing I do like about this motherboard is the fact that it has like the, it has an X8, although that does take from the GPU. But then you also have like this X1 and this X4 down here. The only thing that this doesn't have, it being a B650, is the fact that it doesn't have 24 lanes of Gen 5. You have four lanes of Gen 5, which means you do have one. Gen 5 drive slot up at the top here. And that's not going to affect your uh, GPU. The GPU is going to be Gen 4. On 16 lanes of its own. So it's on a different bus. 
So th this right here is essentially CPU lanes of Gen 5 to the CPU for the M.2, CPU lanes for the graphics card, and then all these other like SSD slots and then all this other stuff down here. This is going to be all like chipset based, I, I believe. It's going to be like uh, you get eight and then you get four. So yeah. They could simply add a battery dongle. The Pro Art motherboard looks, yeah. But the Pro Art does have the DisplayPort input, though. So, so that is something that y if you're going to need that, it does have it. A lot of these, dis a lot of these motherboards that include Thunderbolt do not have the DisplayPort input. Uh, instead, what they do, uh, you know, like if we look at the the Steel Legend. So this is the type. This is the Asrock B650E. I believe this thing does uh, Gen. Uh, or I think this has. Uh, oh, let's go in here. Yeah, Asrock actually has very good block diagrams. They don't look as cool as Gigabytes, but they're very thorough. Like they're very straightforward and they're very easy to read. So here's the block diagram for the Asrock Steel Legends. It's probably going to blind a bunch of people. But I need to zoom in to show this. So let me make sure. Is Thunderbolt on here? Uh, Maybe not. Oh, no. Yeah, the Steel Legend, the Steel Legend doesn't include Thunderbolt. But I believe the Steel Legend has a add-in port for Thunderbolt. Somewhere. Well, it's, I'm going to have to look at the... We're going to have to look at the diagram up here. Yes, yeah, so there it is. Number 26. This number tw this right here, this is a Thunderbolt header. So number 26, there it is. 5-pin Thunderbolt add-in card connector TB1. There it is. So you can add Thunderbolt to a B650 East Steel Legend from ASRock. And there's that single B650 chipset that I was talking about. So if you look at this, this is a B650E motherboard, which means you have 24 lanes of gen... Well, okay, it looks like what they're doing is they took... They took the four remaining lanes and they downgraded it to gen 3. So so it's, it's a little bit more nuanced when you start looking at the lower end motherboards because they're cutting costs to bring the cost down. So this one actually has... 16 lanes of Gen 5 to the GPU, 4 lanes of Gen 5 to the first M.2, so that's 20 lanes of Gen 5, and then the 4 lanes that could have been Gen 5, they've downgraded to Gen 3 for an open X4 PCIe slot. This is typically going to be for that Thunderbolt add-in card or uh, Avermedia or Elgato uh, 4K60 capture card, because you don't need Gen 5 to achieve Thunderbolt 4, you only need four lanes of Gen 3 to get Thunderbolt 4 working. So this is sufficient for Thunderbolt 4. But that is worth noting. You do not have like the full 24 lanes of Gen 5. You have 20 lanes of Gen 5 to the CPU, and you have four lanes of Gen 3 to the CPU. And then everything else is going to be off of the, the single chipset. Uh, this, is, this stands for Promontory 21, uh, which is basically a B650 chipset. So you have 2.5 gig Realtek. You have AMD Wi-Fi. RZ608 is the AMD Wi-Fi module. AMD now has Wi-Fi themselves um, instead of having to use Realtek. So you get Realtek 2.5. You get AMD Wi-Fi 6E. And then you get two more uh, Gen 4 drives. So video. Oh, hold on. So there was more. You have the X670E-E Strix was running really well for a month even on that. But then I entered SOC Vulture manually and from then on some boots I get high latency boots. Do you have um, do you have memory context restore enabled? Gold bullets? And not even stable past two. Oh, I don't. What did you set the val val voltage to? Might have put the voltage too high. Voltage can't really go. You shouldn't really run SOC voltage beyond 1.3. Uh, 
I mean, you you can do 1.4, but I would not do 1.4. That's too high. I wouldn't do more than 1.3. Uh, I personally am running my SOC voltage at 1.25 volts, and I'm running the VDDIO MEM voltage at 1.35 volts. Is the stream lagging? It should be working. It was on 1.43 on auto and then you entered 1.4, which basically what it was on because BIOS adds another three. Yeah, that's... Oh, that's too, that's really high voltage. Yeah, it looks like some people were checking. I don't see, I don't see any indication of a problem. Is the video, Fine. Hmm. If you turn XMP on to 6000, it goes auto Asus. Oh, you're using Asus? Okay. Well, I oh, yeah, you said you have the Strix. That's a lot of voltage, though. Wow. Yeah, uh, hmm, I don't know. I I've I've been using my so on the Gigabyte Aorus Master, my the auto so auto. If you turn XMP or Expo, mine I've seen it do like 1.15, uh, which typically doesn't work with 6,000 megahertz. Uh, well, okay, it will work with 6,000 megahertz, but if you put the computer to sleep, like if you put the computer into S3 sleep and you wake it up. Uh, oftentimes, that low SOC voltage, for some reason, causes the memory to not be stable, or it causes some kind of system instability. So what I end up doing is I, I, I manually set SOC vCore to 1.25 volts. And ever since I did that, I haven't had any problems with sleep not working. Yeah, but that's uh, that's one example of a a pretty good motherboard for you know relatively for B six fifty E Steel Legend two thirty nine. Now, obviously, this is based off of the U S. prices on Newegg, but you know this this motherboard seems like it's a pretty good one. Twenty lanes Gen five. You get M.2 Gen 5, you get uh, Thunderbolt optional add-in capability. So to me, this seems like it's pretty good. You even get the anti-sag GPU, anti-sag bracket. So something like this. Like th this to me is a relatively good budget motherboard. Um, for those that were asking, an another one. So I did mention B650E Aorus Master. This one is more expensive, um, but you know, as someone mentioned earlier, there was some kind of issue with the early, the early revision chipset, I guess, with the Aorus Master, the B650E Aorus Master, I should add. Um, but this one's this one's kind of like an, a a really really nice all rounder because it it's single chipset. It has the postcode debug LED. You know, it has 24 lanes of Gen 5. They're all, all 24 of them are Gen 5 lanes. Uh, if we look at the manual, 
just to kind of look at what a gigabyte block diagram so you can see like the Aorus Master one thing about this one though is it's it's kind of weird so this one what they do with this is they they do take lanes from the graphics card in order to allow you to do four gen 5 drives um but realistically like you can run two m.2 drives m2a and m2d i believe they go direct to the cpu and they don't use any lanes from the graphics card but these other two m2b and m2 i think m2b and m2c or m2d yeah m2 yeah m2b and m2c use graphics card lanes to run so that is one thing to be aware of if you are looking at the b650e or its master uh, but it does have the option for thunderbolt 4 on a b650 motherboard it does have the postcode debug on a b650e motherboard um, so but that's really the only thing that it compromises on is the fact that it does drop the graphics card just like on the intel motherboard it drops the graphics card down to XA if you're going to run a third and fourth M.2 drive. You can still run, you know, these two natively without any issue or without any uh, lane usage off the graphics card. But that is the downside of a single chipset, like with Intel, where there's only one chipset for connectivity. So they could have done things a little differently here, but I think that's a fair trade considering what this motherboard gives you on the chipset. You still get, you know, that X4 for the PCI 4 lane. So you can run a Thunderbolt card in here or you could run a capture card in here. You get two free lanes. This could be like a 10 gigabit LAN add-in card. Uh, assuming they're going to sell those soon. I don't know of any that are available right now. And then you still have Wi-Fi 6E and you still have the 2.5 gigabit LAN. And you still have the four SATA drives. So um, it's a good... I, I think this is a fair trade-off considering what this motherboard is offering you why does it go adcb i have no idea why they chose that um i think that what this means is well you know honestly i i don't know because this one is closer to the cpu so you would think that this should be m2b but nope they named it m2d i don't know why they did that so that's yeah I no idea but the thing is, all of them go to the CPU. Every single M.2 drive on this motherboard go directly to the CPU. They bypass the chipset. The only drawback is two of them achieve that by taking lanes from the graphics cards X16. So it'll drop it to X8. Um, but, you know, it drops it to X8, but it's utilizing all of the lanes. See? 8 plus 4 plus 4, that totals to 16 lanes. Whereas on the Z790, the Z790 Aorus Master does 8 plus 4 plus 4, but it's actually not wired to anything. They're wasting 4 lanes on the Intel motherboard on that switch going literally to nothing. So instead of giving you another drive for the trade-off of cutting your lanes in half, they, on the Intel motherboard they only give you 4 lanes uh, and then, you know, you're stuck with 8 on the GPU. That's, eh, you know, that just kind of feels bad. At least the B650E still gives you that extra drive. That, that's what I'm trying to say. So, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, that's way too low. Wait, which one? Oh, oh, the, the voltage. It's actually a decent switch for the price. Stay away from that. Oh, the the Z, the Z. A lot of people say Z790, Z790. If you're in the U.S., you'll say Z790. If you're in Canada or I guess in the rest of the world, you'll say Z, Z790. I know the Australians will say Z, Z and Z, Z790, Z790. Just don't get it if you have 76 because you'll never know if the motherboard is faulty. <laughs> wow yeah i need to read up on that because i i i know i think that was mentioned before on a previous live stream about the the b650e Aorus master um but i i don't know i've never 
Never seen much about that. But anyway, this is kind of like a high-end B650E. This is this is the most expensive. This and the Asus Strix B650E-E are the two most expensive uh, B650E motherboards. However, the Gigabyte one, unlike the Asus one, the Gigabyte one does utilize every single lane, whereas the Asus one leaves some lanes... Well, actually, no. I, I have to remember. I did a video analysis on the Asus and the Gigabyte B650E boards that are on the channel. But I forget. I've looked at so many motherboards that I, I, I kind of forget. Because at some point, they overlap in terms of the feature set. Because there's so many of them. You made a Reddit thread and so many people had this issue. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to look it up. Because that's something I need to be aware of, too. Because I didn't know. I didn't know much about any kind of, like known issue with any sort of B650E or just any motherboard in general. With the 5600X? Uh, no, that would have been a, that's a different platform completely. See, it has, it has the proper cooling for Gen 5. Yeah, but on B650? Oh, B550. Yeah, because it's a different chipset. Really strange, you know, like uh, some... When you start looking at B650 motherboards and B650E... It, you have to really, really do your research because oftentimes these motherboards on the B chipset as opposed to the X chipset are typically going to have to cut corners in order to meet a certain price point. Yeah, but the BIOS file, the BIOS file is always going to be the same though. Right, like, like just to add a few strings for the voltage for the motherboard names, or I mean the the CPU names, that's not going to use up that much space. I mean, we're talking like in the kilobytes. Um, but yeah, the BIOS should be a uh, big enough to take that into account. I remember MSI back with like the first X three seventy motherboards. I remember MSI had a BIOS size that was too small. Like, the chip was too small to fit, like, the BIOS for a... I think it was Zen 2, so, like, the Ryzen 3000 CPUs. So, I, I remember MSI, in order to get Zen 2 CPUs working on MSI X370 and, I think, maybe X470 motherboards, they had to drop the UI, so the user interface... For the UEFI went back to their older click BIOS instead of the one that they typically use with their higher end motherboards. I remember that. Because I remember I had like a an X370 X Power Gaming Titanium. And that thing, like I remember upgrading the BIOS on there. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wow, the the BIOS is all, like, monochrome. <laughs> it's like all the colors are gone. <laughs> it's all black and white now. <laughs> and that's because they had to drop the graphics, like, the little, like, uh, BIOS graphics down to save space. So I guess the, the JPEGs or the GIFs or whatever they use for the backgrounds and stuff, they had to remove a lot of that. But yeah, like if you're building new, if you're building a, a work one of these strictly for productivity, then you're really probably gonna be fine with a normal standard 7950X or or a standard like non 3D Vcash CPU. I think the only people who should be considering the X3D CPU, so like the 7950X3D or the 7900X3D, 
are people who are going to use their computer for productivity, but they also want it to game really well. So it's kind of like it's a weird, almost like a niche demographic. Although, you know, having said that, it typically could be the same category of people that would look at a Raptor Lake CPU. So maybe I'm overthinking that. Azrock loves putting weird art in their biomes. <laughs> I've been so unlucky with this AM5 upgrade. You bought MSI Meg 1300A. I have the exact same power supply. Really? You So you, you got the exact same... Because I have an unboxing video of that exact same motherboard. I mean, the exact same power supply. The MSI Meg AI 1300P. ATX 3.0, PCI 5.0 um, power supply. And that's the power supply that I'm using right now. <laughs> this very computer is using the MSI power supply. <laughs> now you got me worried. Now I'm wondering, like, is this thing, you know, I need to make sure that, uh, yeah, I have the exact same power supply. No shot at all of it. It is faulty. Wow. <laughs> Oh, that's the video that you saw. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been using it, and the thing that worries me, the only thing that I'm a little concerned about for the power supply, longevity-wise, is because I'm using a, a fractal... So, the case that I'm using is a fractal torrent RGB... This is the this is the case. So you guys see, this is the case that I'm using with my current PC. The one that we're streaming on right now. So the, the only thing about this case that's a little strange or a little non-conventional -con or unconventional, I should say, is the power supply. The power supply on this case mounts at the top. So the power supply in this case, so in this case the MSI Meg 1300 watt is situated up here. At the top of the power or the top of the case that means that all the heat all the heat that is pushed from the cpu and the graphics card specifically more so the graphics card while gaming and streaming and gaming simultaneously there's a lot of heat generated but a lot of that heat is going to get pushed to the upper back corner of the case which is typically where the power supply is up at the top because the power supply's fan is located right here and when that thing starts spinning that's just going to inhale all the hot air from the case and then push it out the back which means the operating temperatures under load on this power supply is going to be higher than if it were a bottom mounted power supply that's the only thing i don't really like about this case um, but other than that, this case is, is really, really nice. So, does it get really hot on idle? Uh, not really. Um, it, it does while gaming and streaming. Like, okay, right now I'm just streaming. I'm not playing any games. So my graphics card right now, even though it's encoding the video, it isn't really doing that much. So in terms of the heat, it's not that hot right now. Like, I can even check. Like, I can I can touch the top of the case. It's a little warm, but it's not, like, super warm. Compared to if I was playing a game like Hogwarts Legacy and streaming at the same time, if I go and touch my, the back of the case where the power supply is, that's going to be significantly hotter than the way it is right now. So, is it hot to the touch at idle? Not really, No. I mean, it's, 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 it's warmer. What I'll say is it's warmer than the rest of the case, but it's not hot to the touch. Like, if I put my hand here, I'm putting my hand on it right here, because it's over here. It's, I could leave my hand on there permanently, and it wouldn't disturb my hand. So, yeah. But see, I, I don't know how much of that is due to the fact that it's mounted at the top, because you notice, remember, warm air rises naturally, which means all the hot air from inside the case will eventually affect the power supply's ambient temperature. So, I don't know. 
Like, you don't know what power supply to go for now. I, honestly, what I would tell you is if you if you want a power supply and you don't want to worry about it overheating and, and you're going for a high wattage power supply, like 1300 watts, get a large power supply. So what do I mean by that? Remember in my video, if you watch the video where I install the MSI Meg power supply, I do a side-by-side -side comparison with my older Corsair 1200 watt, and the Corsair is significantly taller and larger, which means it is physically able to dissipate the heat. So Corsair HX 1200, if we go here, assuming they have one, here we go. So see, like this, the fact that this power supply is physically longer, it's more rectangular, whereas the uh, the MSI Meg is kind of small. It's almost like a cube. It's not, it's not a cube. It's still a rectangle, but it's not like as long as this. It's physically smaller. And I had a little concern when I first... I mean, I, I mentioned that in my video, that I was concerned about the size of the MSI power supply being so small for something rated at 1300 watts, uh, you know, to me, it should be a larger chassis. Like the physical box housing the unit should be larger. So, yeah, this thing never runs hot. And the thing is, I had this in my fractal torrent up at the top for probably ever since I had the torrent. Uh, and it, yeah, the operating temperatures were never bad. So, so the fact that it's larger, it's able to spread the heat load better <laughs> than a smaller power supply. <laughs> Psychoholic1000 just subscribed. <laughs> Welcome to the channel. If you have any questions, anybody who's watching or even if you're subscribed or unsubscribed, feel free to ask a question if you're curious about any sort of component. If you're thinking about upgrading, regardless of what you're upgrading to, it doesn't really matter uh, in my mind. If you want to go Intel AMD, that's fine. But if you have any question about the platform, a motherboard, a CPU recommendation, power supply recommendation, memory recommendation, just as examples... Um, you know, feel free to just reach out in the chat. Uh, you know, we'll be able to answer any of those questions. So I think this is something that I would go with. Like, in, in my case, I really just wanted a PCI 5 ATX 3.0 power supply. And I didn't think that the MSI... I'm not saying it's bad, because my experience with it uh, is not terrible. I mean, it's I haven't had any issues, you know knock on wood that everything's going to be fine but the fact that it's so small it's physically so small that's the only thing that to me is kind of questionable for such a high wattage unit so that's all i'll say on it but the thing is like i i haven't had any problems with it and i've been using it since i've gotten it day one in in the streaming pc um which is the pc that i use the most having said that so and I haven't had any problems. So the water paints. You've been going through this back and forth for the last two months. You've helped. <laughs> oh, Beatles. <laughs> Beatles just subbed to the channel. Uh, I kind of thought... I, I thought Beatles... I thought you were subbed to the channel. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the channel. Um, water paints. You've been through this back and forth. Last two months, uh, you will go pro pro art creator with a 7950X or X3D, but I think I lose productivity performance. Okay, so that brings me back to what I was going to talk about in the like review analysis, looking at the, the various reviews online. So what I've noticed, the general consensus is if you want to play games in any capacity, the 7950X3D is going to be a better long-term investment than the 7950X. Um, the other thing that's nice about it is it's more energy efficient while gaming um, and just doing anything, really, than the 7950X. The only thing that it loses is, ever so slightly, it loses in productivity. But it really doesn't lose that much. In fact, I kind of think that it's, it's, it's sort of a negligible loss in terms of the 
the amount of performance you lose. So kind of if we look at value and conclusion, we just skip to the value and conclusion for Tech Power Up's review of the 750X3D. Um, it says, well, let's look at the pros, but I think somewhere in here he'll tell you the performance loss. So the pros and the cons. The pros, finally, 3D vCache for Zen 4. Incredible energy efficiency. That was matches the i9-13900K gaming performance. Uh, great gaming performance improvement over previous Zen 4. Customization options available for scheduler. It's easy to manually override game support for the scheduler. PCI 5 support for storage and graphics. This is the thing that we were talking about on the motherboards. You get PCI 5 for storage and graphics. And that may not mean much to us today. But, you know, long term, this will mean more. Because the thing is, remember when we were talking about PCI 4, you know, earlier we were saying, okay, well, gamers today don't need Gen 5. Uh, people who do content creation today don't necessarily need Gen 5. Well, the same thing could be said about Gen 4 back in 2019 when the X570 motherboard first came to market with Zen 2 and that brought PCI Gen 4 to the market. But at the time, who, who was using Gen 4? No one, right? Here we are today and, you know, like the fastest Gen 4 SSDs are out, like the Fire CUDA, um, the Samsung 990 or 980 Pro, like all those very high, you know, like 7,000 megabytes per second Gen 4 drives. In some cases, some of them are, are, are breaking beyond that theoretical maximum. Um, and now Gen 4, you know, seems a lot more affordable than it was years ago. So that makes sense. But you got to remember, somebody who has a X570 motherboard from 2019 that started on something like a 3600 Ryzen 5. You know, today they could be running on a 5800X3D and also pair that up with a top of the line Gen 4 SSD. And they didn't have to change the motherboard. The motherboard's literally from 2019 and they still have all that capability today. So that's the reason why this does actually matter. You know, it's, it's, it's way down here. It's not even at the top of the bullet list, but, you know, it's, it's one that's going to make more sense, like, years from now. Integrated graphics is there. We knew that. Existing coolers are compatible. So the cool thing about the X3D is you can literally cool this with any, like, Noctua air cooler, and you'll be fine. Like, and, and, like if you want to go high-end air, like a Noctua NHD 15, that's what I personally use. Uh, with my 7950X, uh, that would work totally fine, especially because this thing uses less power the, than the non-3D, and it uses, uh, like, the TDP is only 120 watts. It, it also has a lower TJ Max, like 89 versus 95. So air cooling on this is actually more suitable than it was on the standard Zen 4. Um, that's why they say existing coolers compatible. And then support for DDR5. Uh, we already knew that. And then 5 and 6 nanometer TSMC. So it's basically the latest TSMC, which is the same as Zen 4. And then support for AVX512 and AI instructions. So, you know, it has stuff that Intel used to have, but for some reason got rid of, starting with Alder Lake. And then, um, you know, I don't know. If, if you want this, typically you had to buy... A server or workstation now you don't ha actually need to do that with a Zen 4 CPU but the cons you know high price so yeah it's expensive thermal limit lowered I don't know why this is considered a con I kind of see this as a pro but I guess if you're someone who likes to overclock maybe this could be a con no multiplier based overclocking this literally means no OC mode you're typically gonna have to use PBO and curve optimizer if you want to overclock these 3D vCache only on one CCD. Yeah, but see, that's the whole idea behind uh, you get the best of both worlds. You get high frequency on the non-3D, and you get, you know, the big 3 cache on the 3D vCache CCD. So few games aren't properly detected as game. So that's that's something that will have to be tuned with their little chipset driver in for further updates. Um, but again, with the Xbox Game Bar, it's typically just a click and you just select, you know, like 
treat this as always a game. So that's today we have to do it manually, but you know, eventually that's going to be fixed. Some setup verification required for optimal performance. Yeah, and I agree there. That was surprising. Like all the stuff that, that Leo from Kit Guru showed that he had to do. Like there are some steps to get the best performance. And then lower clocks. You know, that's understandable because of the Vcash, dual CCD, and the lower power limit, I should add. Dual CCD design costs some performance. Uh, expensive platform, long boot times, no cooler included. Okay, so basically the same, uh, mostly the same negatives that the previous Zen 4 initially had. Um, but, you know, like better gaming performance than Zen 4. Uh, in most cases, better gaming performance than Raptor Lake. Way less power than Raptor Lake and Zen 4, the standard Zen 4. So, you know, to me, it seems like this would be the one that I would recommend if you're someone who's looking at building a brand new system um, and you're on currently on a much, much older system, regardless of whether you're on DDR3 or DDR4. Um, but I think just to answer the question about productivity, you lose almost nothing, really. I think it was in here... Falls behind a bit. Da, 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 da. There was a review that I saw. Maybe it was Kit Guru, but somebody showed. No, I think it was in here. I thought it was it was in here. In terms of like the percent loss. It's not much, though. We'll have to probably dig for it in the review. All I know is that the amount of performance that you lose for productivity is on the area. It's, it's in the range of like 0 to 2%. Uh, but the amount you gain in gaming over the standard 7950X is significant. We're talking like 15 to 25%. And the amount you gain in gaming over the Raptor Lake i9 is anywhere from 2 to 5 to 6%. I think AMD, their own number was 6%. Um, and then, you know, depending on who you look at, the reviews are going to be kind of all over the place. So in some cases, it's it's slower in gaming than the 13900K. And in most cases, it's faster. I think the average that I saw looking at like five different reviews, because I looked at Gamers Nexus. Um, I looked at obviously Tech Power Up, Kit Guru, Hardware Unboxed, and I think Tech Testers and one of the other ones too. I think I also did. I also looked at Wendell from Level One Tech's review. I think I looked at like six or seven reviews, and in my mind, the average gaming over like the gaming it for the X3D versus the 1300K was like plus six percent in favor of the AMD 3D Vcash CPU. So somewhere around there. So anywhere from like as low as you know. Minus 2 to plus 12. Somewhere in that range. In that like 10%. Well, it's actually more like 14 range total. So, I mean, if I was building... Like if I was in your boat, like water paints... I would probably get the 3D. Like, personally, because if you're going to do it... Especially since, like... Unless you absolutely don't play any games at all... Then the 7950X makes sense... Because you will save money up front... Getting the standard CPU... Compared to buying the 3D. Um, but, you know, in some of these cases... Like, the 3D is even faster than the 7950X for like productivity stuff so like let's look at some of these server and workstation 
virtual box see this to me is interesting because i always thought i always thought that the 13900k would be but see the thing is this is so close this is so close like oracle's virtual box we're talking 20 20 seconds versus like 21 seconds on the non 3d and if we're looking at 13900k we're talking 20 seconds again versus like 21 seconds it, they're so close in some of these. Yeah, in some games, they're literally the same or worse. Like, uh, w one thing I noticed <laughs> is that uh, for some games, like the the, the games where the 7950X, so the standard non-3D, in the games where that CPU was winning against the competition... It was still winning against the 3D Vcash CPU. Um, but in, in games where the 13900K was faster than the 7950X, then the 3D Vcash CPU was like either right up there with 13900K or was faster than 13900K. You only play one game, Star Wars Battlefront 2. Yeah, so the thing is, like with multiplayer, You'll never notice the difference between any of these CPUs. You can't get a read on why they're hiding the substantially worse performance or same performance, so substantially better value. You know, I was really interested in why they didn't show that. Uh, my guess is that either the scaling on the 7900X3D, it, it's either going to be really... It's, it's kind of like what you just said. Either it's going to be... No, I don't think it's going to be substantially worse, but I think either it's just not going to scale significantly better than the non-3D um, for the price. Or, or what could be happening is the 7900X3D ends up being so close to the 7950X3D in gaming to the point where it's the same situation that you had with the 13900K versus the i7 13700K. The 13700K is so close to the 13900K that, you know, it's the smart buy for someone who wants to build a gaming PC on an Intel platform would be to buy the 13700K and pretend the 13700K doesn't exist. Because the 13700K uses way less power than a 13900K while still giving you all eight of the performance cores. Um, so I, I, I have a feeling that the 7900X3D might be the same sort of scenario. The only difference is now we're looking at an AMD processor as opposed to an Intel processor. Because you guys have to remember, when Intel launched 13900K, they did not sample 13700K. When Intel, you have to remember that when Intel launched Raptor Lake last year, they only gave reviewers the 13900K and the 13600K, the i5 and the i9. They conveniently left out the middleman i7 13700K because, as we found out with the reviews, the 13700K is basically the 13900K in gaming uh, while costing significantly less and not really sacrificing any performance cores. So I have a feeling that we might see a similar thing with the 7900X3D where it gives you the cash, you get the same kind of scaling, and who knows, maybe the gaming performance is so close on those Vcash that 6 and 8 core you know, with Vcash doesn't really show that much of a difference. And hence that might be the reason why AMD never made a 5600X3D because... They probably did some internal testing. It was like, well, this thing is very, very close. Um, but then they would end up they would end up in a situation where if they had a 5600X3D and a 5800X3D, if the 5600X3D was so close 
to the 5800X 3D in gaming, you know, most people would probably save money and buy the lower cost SKU. So I think we may see a similar scenario play out here with the 7900X 3D. Yeah, well, it's less cores, but the thing is they're all still performance cores. You gotta remember that it's all still performance. You're still getting like 12, 12 full cores. The only difference is six of them have... Yes, it's 12 cores. So, the, so they're gonna be like... Uh, where's my... Where's paint again? So the... Yeah, it's gonna be... Um, for the 79, it's six... Six core, 12 thread over here, and then another six core, 12 thread over here, and then this one's the one that's going to have the V cache. So that's that's the only difference if we're talking about the V cache CPU. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think that in most games, though, uh, they're going to be very, very similar. I think in productivity is where this is going to fall off more. More than the 32 thread. Because you're talking... Now you're talking uh, 32... You're, now it's, it's 24 thread versus, like, 32 thread on uh, the full... 7950X 3D. So that's that's what I think it's going to boil down to. But I, I think in gaming, because, you know, like in some games, yeah, the 7700X is faster than a 7600X in, in gaming. Now, I'm not talking about any sort of productivity workload because in productivity workloads, the cores matter and you do see linear scaling with more cores. So that's why a lot of people uh, kind of ignored the 7600X. But with this, you know, you still have 12 cores. So you still have that whole other CCD. So um, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to perform. Um, what could be the case is in productivity, because it's only 24 threads, it's significantly worse than the 7950X 3D. But then in gaming, it's too close where you know, like, mo you know, now they're gonna have a hard time selling their top end SKU. I don't know. It could be kind of weird like that. Um, I I don't know. I think in gaming though, it should be fine, right? Because not that many games, not that many games need like twelve threads, and you know, one CCD is twelve threads with the V cache. But it's the same sort of thing on the Intel side, like. 13700K is the smart buy on the Intel. Not 13900K is the stupid buy for gaming. 13700K is actually where it's at. You reckon 7950X 3D still loses to tuned in Warzone 2? It will be like 2 to 3 either way. I mean, I guess. But see, the thing is, like, what's what's weird about the 3D Vcash CPUs is if you turn off the non-3D CCD, then, like, all of a sudden the performance is better. That's the reason why it's kind of weird. Like, I, I don't think the... I don't expect the 7900X 3D to outperform the 7950X 3D in gaming, but either... They're going to be really, really close, or they're going to be really far apart in productivity. And then I think the 7800X 2D is probably going to be the fastest gaming CPU. Because it's not going to have any sort of concerns with the scheduler. So, at you know, like, we've already kind of seen simulated benchmarks for the... Um, the, what is it, the 7800X 3D.
Does RAM tuning help? That's a question that comes up a lot. Um, I don't really know if it helps it that much. That, because what I've heard is that a lot of people say that the 3D V-cache kind of like prevents the need for running high frequency RAM. Or I guess it, it reduces the dependency on high frequency RAM in order to see a significant increase in gaming performance. That's what I've heard. Now, I've never had a 5800X 3D, so I can't verify those claims. You bought a 4090 and tried to hit 300 FPS in Warzone 2. Thanks for your answers. <clears throat> yeah, the thing is that they're going to be really close. The performance is really close at that point, though. So just keep that in mind. That, that's why I'm saying, like, the smart man's buy for the Intel is a 13700K. Because you can still tune a 13700K for Warzone 2 to get the same performance as a 13900K. <clears throat> Those E-cores in the 13900K, you know, it has eight more E-cores. It's like, that's not going to help in Warzone 2. The thing that I'm going to be interested to see is, like, what happens in Warzone 2 if you have, like, a 7800X 3D? Like, a single a single CCD, so there's no scheduling, there's no switching, potentially, between CCDs. You know what I'm saying? So, that'll be interesting to see. You like the new Vcash? Wait, for Frame Chasers to review it, that's his game, and he full tunes his tunes for his reviews. The new Vcash chips, but one concern for me is the ideal power. You hate the idea of using so much power while the CPU is doing nothing. The new Vcash. The idle power, though, is like, okay, on the Gigabyte motherboard, you have to remember that that's going to be very motherboard specific. The, the C states. Like, how the motherboard firmware handles the C states is going to determine your idle power. Um, the asymmetrical design could be super interesting for those who are willing to do manual CPU affinity like dumping all interrupt onto non yeah lunch that's the, that's the sort of thing that I that I was kind of interested in too when I first heard about these CPUs um, but I, I don't know how much of it like how much of dumping like the interrupts onto the like the OS interrupts, right? Like if you dump all those onto the regular, like the non Vcash, like does that actually benefit? Like that's a thing, right? Like in theory, you would think that it would because those cores can clock higher. But my only thing with that is how many of those kind of background tasks actually need the super high frequency of the non 3D Vcash versus just completing the task on one of the cores that has access to the Vcash. You know what I'm saying? So that, that it's kind of like it, in theory you would think that it would be a smart move, but it, it's one of those things where it's like it sounds good in practice or it sounds good in theory, but it might not really translate into a a good benefit in the real world. frame chasers the thing the thing is the 3d hold up so the thing with the x3d like frame chasers said you don't have to stare at bio screens um well no hold on a second so i think what frame chasers means by that is you you just set your you all you do is you just set pbo you set whatever the best like negative offset uh, on curve optimizer you can get for your CPU. So based off of like how good your CPU is via the silicon lottery, you just set it and forget it and you just go. That's what he's saying. You don't have to waste time messing with uh, you know like multipliers, voltages, 
offsets, um, look, you know, like VCCSA, and then, then like RAM tuning and all that extra stuff. You don't have to do a lot of that with the 3DV cache CPU. That's what he's saying. Because the thing is, so like the reality, what he's saying is like if you want to get the most amount of performance uh, on a manual overclock, regardless whether you're on AMD or Intel, you have to put in the time to tune the system manually. Like on, in the case of Intel, you can't just go and like set the RAM to like 7200 megahertz and just think that it's going to work without doing anything else. You know what I'm saying? Like you're going to have to manually figure out what tertiary timings work, what voltage on the RAM you actually need to handle that um, at full load. And then like on the CPU side, what is the IMC voltage going to need to be? What's the system agent V core going to be? You know, like there's a bunch of things that go on behind the scenes to get that result. You can't just be like, oh, I'm just going to set 7200 and it's good. Right, and you're gonna only be on like 32 gigs of RAM. That's the other thing too. You can't really do that with like 64 or 128 gigs. Non really, not non really a frequency issue, but system latency, especially for things like mouse pulling. I think I remember seeing decent boost with RAM tuning. Not 100 percent though. Yeah, I'm not sure. It'll be interesting to see with the with the dual CCD Zen 4 though, because. What, what I'm thinking is going to happen is, like, Zen 4 X3D, like, the Vcache CCD doesn't need the fast RAM, but you're still going to need, optimally, for the non-Vcache, you're still going to want, like, 6,000 megahertz with the Buildzoid tune timings. You can gain up to 25% in simulators with high-speed B-Die with the... Okay, I didn't know that. Warzone is crazy with RAM on stock. 7700X, 4090 gets 150, 160 on tune. RAM you get... Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> so the thing is, you know, if you if, if it... So if you tune the RAM, that means that the standard CCD can benefit from the RAM. But that's what that goes back to what I just said, right? Like, like the Vcache CCD, yeah, the RAM tuning will help, but it's like the the amount by which the amount it helps is not going to be as much. Uh, whereas the other CCD, like if we're talking like dual CCD, right? So like 7950x 3D the other CCD will probably benefit from the tuned RAM. So it's like you can't mess it up, right? <laughs> it's like you can't mess it up in Warzone. If it's, if you got tuned RAM and Vcash, you're probably, that's probably a bulletproof strategy right there. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it. If you're able to get that kind of performance just by tuning the RAM on a non-3D part, would you recommend 232 over 216 gaming and streaming? I would, but don't expect to run it that fast. I I I personally am running two 32 gig dims right now on Zen 4. So that's what I would recommend. But if you want to run like, you know, above 6000 megahertz, you're not going to go above 2x16 to do that. Cuz you're you're not going to be running like over 6000 megahertz on like 232 or 64 gigs. You're going to be doing like 6,000. That's basically it. I mean, you could do 64, but you know, you're, you're going to be in gear two mode and good luck trying to get those, those timings to work at full load on 64 gigs. Watchdog Legion was crazy for Ram. see if I can find um, let's 
Just get 6,000. C30 should be fine. Hold on. Felipe is saying lots of games using 13900. This are running 500 plus. We are seeing other bottlenecks besides the CPU being the ben the benchmark so close between. Uh, that's that's what I was saying earlier. The the fact is the problem here. Here's the thing, right? Like at those frame rates, you're at you're at the diminishing returns. You're at diminishing returns. Like at that point, like why does it, what does it matter? <laughs> On Asus Hero, they're running 64. Yeah, you can run 64 on the 7950X. Thir yeah, and 2133 F clock, but but you're gonna be in gear two mode, so you're gonna be running like U clock is half mem clock. But yeah, F clock can be 2133 all day, but you're still running like mem clock. You're you're running uh, what is it? 30 half of 32, so 1600 on the UMC, on the crosshair. Hero. So AMD is... No one's saying you can't do 64 on Zen 4. The reason why no one is doing like 6400 on Zen 4 is uh, typically because you're going to be running in Gear 2 mode, just like on Intel. But Intel's always Gear 2 mode. We talked about that in a previous stream. Um, he's in Gear 1. Well, I would like to know what his voltages are to be able to maintain that. Because that's typically not going to be 100% stable in Gear 1. RAM tends to be... I know because I tested it. Like, the thing is, it might it might be stable at, on gear 1 at 64. If you boot into Windows, it's stable. But, like, try running Forspoken. Try, run, try streaming and running Forspoken at 4K. And then see what happens with that type of uh, gear 1 and 6400. Yeah, yeah. Typically, if you go over six thousand, you're gonna be in gear one or gear two mode, in order for it to be stable. Like, and I'm saying like a hundred percent stable. You know, it's possible your friend is doing sixty four hundred gear one, and he's probably you know like ninety ninety five percent stable. But there's a high probability that there's something that's gonna cause that to crash in a game or something. Intel runs RAM better. Yes, the reason why Intel is running RAM better is because Intel is always running in gear 2 mode. He says he's stable. Well, okay. I mean, we can only take his word for it, but there are so many things that you can do to cause it to, like, to stress stability, like what I was saying earlier. But from what I know, from my own testing that I've done, Anything over 6,000 um, in gear one is not 100% stable. Like, you're, like, there's a high probability that if, like, like, I'm just saying right now, like, if I'm running 64 gigs of RAM, if I overclocked my RAM to 64 gigs, now granted, I'm running dual rank 32 gig DIMMs, Hynix RAM, if I overclock my RAM to 6,400 megahertz and stay in gear one, I can boot into Windows, but if I start, if I load up Hogwarts Legacy and then try to stream simultaneously, this PC will either blue screen within one hour, or the game will crash to the desktop, or something weird like that will happen to me. So that's I'm just saying, like that's that's what I personally have been able to duplicate with my own testing. But if I run it in Gear Two mode, if I go to Gear Two mode just like Intel, yeah, then it's gonna actually work. But you're still having to run at those high voltages. And I would rather run at 6,000, you know, at 1.35 volts and be 100% stable than run at like 1.4 volts or 1.43 volts um, and then have to up my SOC voltage, you know, all that other stuff. And then uh, run in gear two mode. You know, I'd rather not have to do all those extra hoops um, just to like run from ram at 6400 you know I'm, i would just wait for a zen 5 because it, the reality you guys have to remember zen 1 like first gen ryzen had the exact same 
like limitations on RAM. You couldn't run RAM typically above 3200. If you were lucky, you could run 3200 stable DDR4. Most people were having to settle for 2933 megahertz, especially if they wanted to run 32 gigabytes across four DIMMs, like the way I did back in the days of Zen 1. Um, it wasn't until Zen 2, aka Ryzen 3000 series, where we got a much better IMC on the Ryzen stuff, and then you could run 3200 reliably on four DIMMs, and then with Zen 3, the 5000 series, then that just fixed everything, and then you could do like 3600, you could start messing with F-Clock and all those other things, trying to get F-Clock to 1900, etc. So, like... It, it just went through its its evolution and its phases of maturing the platform and just the CPU architecture overall. So I'm pretty sure we're going to have to go through the exact same thing with Zen 4 and then Zen 5 is going to have the improved IMC and all that stuff. Because you guys have to remember, right? Like, like I said this in a previous live stream. If you look at the difference between Alder Lake and Raptor Lake... In terms of what you can do with DDR5 on the Intel platforms, Raptor Lake is vastly better than Alder Lake with high-speed DDR5. You can't do like 72... You, like all these people talking about 7200 megahertz on Raptor Lake, you can't really do that reliably with Alder Lake. And then the reality with Raptor Lake is if you... As soon as you populate like all four DIMMs, you know, now you're stuck in the same boat where it's like you can't really go that much further than 6400 reliably. And then if you start doing dual rank DIMMs or worse, you try to do 128 gigabytes of RAM, you know, well, good luck. I mean, there goes 7200, not going to be doing 7200 megahertz. So see, all I'm saying is that like Alder Lake to Raptor Lake saw an improvement in DDR5 top speed capability and stability. Zen 4 to Zen 5, we'll see a similar thing across the board. We've already seen this with Zen 1 to Zen 2, and then Zen 2 to Zen 3. So we're going to see the exact same thing on the AMD platform. Some people could win the chip lottery. Yeah, and, and that that's a thing. That's a thing. Intel DDR5 is only gear 2, <clears throat> but still beats AMD's gear 1. Yeah, and, and and what Joey's saying is correct. And the reason why that is, is because remember, what Joey's talking about is DDR5 Raptor Lake against Zen 4 DDR5. So you're talking about Intel 2nd Gen DDR5 memory controller versus AMD 1st Gen DDR5 memory controller. So yeah, it should do better. If Intel's controller wasn't better than AMD's, considering Intel's is the second generation, like, that would kind of be more disappointing than what we see right currently. We have to wait for AMD and Microsoft to optimize the software to use 3 EV cache properly. Well, I mean, it's kind of already there, right? Like, you have the drive... You have their two things you have to install, and, you, and then you have, like, BIOS overrides. So... Once you tune memory on AMD, though, there's practically no difference between 52 and 6,000. In terms of the latency, yeah. It, it, once you tune them, the latency is roughly the same. But you still are getting more read, write, and copy at 6,000 than you are at 5,200. That's because it's just pure frequency differences. Do you really want to see a tuned 6400 on X3D? Someone will probably do it at some point. Seventy seven hundred x does 199 on Watchdog Legion's benchmark because of tuned RAM. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying, like the tuned RAM does help. But I'm saying in terms of the 
the the DDR5 compatibility at like higher speeds um, Intel's going to have a natural advantage because it's a second generation DDR5 controller So, but anyway, like going back to what what I was saying uh, earlier. So, hold on. Let me see. What is this thing? Uh, is this... Let's see. Is this... Uh, here's Paul. I found Paul's review. So, what did he test with? Hold on. Where is the... Uh, so here's Paul's review from Paul's Hardware. I just saw his review pop up in my notification feed. So what did he do? He tested. He tested with. He tested with the exact same Trident Z5 that everybody's talking about. The CL36000. Everybody knows what this RAM is. Everyone's using the exact same RAM. So he used the same RAM on the same on both the Intel and the AMD. And then he's got like the. The, does he have the DDR4 stuff? Oh no, he did a EVGA X6 X570 dark with the DDR4 3600 CL16. So there's the same RAM that everybody <laughs> uses. Everyone's using the same RAM. Uh, the big old 360 radiator. Okay, let's see. Let's see what he does. Let's let's uh, let's. And Intel will push performance until Okay, he tested with a 4090 from NVIDIA, the standard one, the founder's for one. The most recent generations, but AMD's maximum temperature... You know what I noticed, though? Like, with a nobody tested with an AMD GPU. <laughs> like, like, I think one person did. I think I watched... Uh, who did I watch? Like, it wasn't Gamers Nexus. There was somebody who did, like, two... Someone tested 4090 and 7900X3D. Was it, was it Harbor Unboxed? I thought somebody did that. What's the mistake testing with a 7900 XTX? If I'm going to test this, I'm going to be testing with a 7900 XTX. Just saying. But the X3D is a bit lower. At because typically, if anything, if anything, testing with a 7900 XTX. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you guys. I said this in a previous stream. If you want to see Intel at its best, Scaling, you want to test with a Radeon GPU. Typically, Intel wants to be paired up with a Radeon GPU. That sounds so weird, and most of you are probably not going to believe me, but the reality is if you if you had a lot of Radeon cards in the past, like I do, if you don't believe me, go watch my GPU collection video. Um, what you'll notice is, or what I've noticed over the years, and I'm speaking from my own experience, is that if I wanted to get the best scaling like across a list of games i would see the scaling percentages uh sh manifest better on intel cpus than on amd cpus that sounds so counterintuitive considering that the amd gpu is also made by the same company that makes the uh cpu but the thing is it's two different divisions so it's basically like American AMD is making Ryzen. Canadian AMD is making Radeon. I mean, that's, it's always been a thing. Obviously, it's a multinational, it's an international company. So you got people in China working on these. You have people in India working on these. You have people in the Middle East working on this and in Europe, all over the place, working on these products. But at its core, like Ryzen has always been developed typically in Austin, Texas and California, San Jose. And then if we're talking Radeon graphics cards, those things typically are made in Canada. Typically in Markham, in the uh, like greater Toronto area, that is where the Radeon cards are made. So it's like they're two separate entities. So what I have seen in the past, especially in the days of like Haswell, up to like Skylake, up to Coffee Lake, Radeon cards will always show Intel in their best light than NVIDIA cards. What do I mean by that? That means if you take an NVIDIA graphics card and pair it up with an AMD Ryzen and then an Intel Core, you will see that the two of them are more similar 
than if you were to take a Radeon card and run the same tests on Ryzen and then on Intel. What you'd see with the Radeon card is that if you let like let's say let's say we take a game where the 13900K would win against a 7950X. If you run that test on a Radeon GPU, the result for Intel would be a bigger lead over the Ryzen CPU. If you run that same test on an Nvidia graphics card, there will be a smaller lead, which means the difference, the delta between Ryzen and Core is less in a game where it favors Intel. If you're testing with an Nvidia graphics card, I have known this for a long, long time. Another example I can give you is in the FX 8350 Bulls Dozer and, and Pile Driver era. If you ran a GeForce graphics card, typically like a Maxwell 980 Ti or a 970 or something, uh, if you do that on an FX 850 and then you go run the same test on like an Intel i7 Haswell back in the day, or maybe like an Ivy Bridge or a Sandy Bridge, you would not see that big of a delta in the result with the NVIDIA card. The performance would be more consistent, almost like the two CPUs don't matter as much. Whereas with, if you run the test with Radeon, you would typically see a bigger delta in favor of Intel. Now, what I just said probably sounds really, really strange and contradictory to what a lot of people probably believe, thinking that there's some kind of AMD plus AMD special power-up when you combine the two together, but uh, from what I've seen in the field, that's totally not the case. That's no longer accurate due to Sam? Well, no, it still is kind of accurate. What I've noticed is that since 30 series, NVIDIA has become a lot more uh, thread heavy on the CPU overhead side. You do realize that Sam and Resizable Bar are the same thing, right? You have HAGS turned off. What's HAGS? You're correct. NVIDIA uses software for hardware scheduling and AMD has it built in the GPU. Yes, and that's been like that for a long, long time. Okay, so what does... Then explain to me, what does Sam do that Resizable Bar doesn't do? What, what is the difference? Okay, and then that's why my RX 580 always outperformed my GTX 1060 because it was paired with a weak i5. Yes. Yes, Hilipe, you're right. Ex absolutely right. One of these days, I probably need to do a video like that. I'll probably have to do a video. I'll have to do... You know what I'll do? I think I know what I'm going to do now. I, I it, Okay. I don't have... Obviously, I don't have a 3D CPU to compare. But I do have a 7950X. And I do have a 13900K. But the thing is, these two CPUs aren't really that... Like... I don't know. I might... The closest thing... Realistically... Like the 7950X is more like a 12900K and 13700K sort of competitor. Um, because Zen 4 initially was always meant to compete with Alder Lake. Um, so really the correct competition for Raptor Lake is actually the X3D. Technically it's Zen 5, but realistically it won't be Zen 5 because that's too far out. So uh, 7950X3D is the closest thing. But, like, if I was going to do this to kind of prove this out, what I would do is I would test. I would test with my 3090 tie, and then I would also test with a 7900 XT because I do have both of those GPUs, and both of those GPUs are the same performance-wise. Um, hardware excellent. Wait, 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 wait. They are not there technically. Like when AMD on AMD getting 20% from Sam Intel and AMD getting like 5 to 6. Uh, I'm not sure about that. That 20% improvement. Where, like, where's an example of this actually being a thing? Like AMD plus AMD getting 20% from Sam versus Intel plus AMD getting only like 5 to 6%. The 4080 that I have has a massive CPU overhead compared to any other GPU you have had. 
And that's what I was saying earlier. So, like, the th since the 30 series, it became like that. Are you saying AMD should present their new Radeon GPU to Intel to show bigger superiority to NVIDIA? Um, oh, you know what? AMD actually did test with both. I think that's who tested with both. Although, I, I think there was, there was somebody on YouTube. Uh, was it Paul? No, it wasn't Paul. Um, like, what did he do? He tested 4K. So with at 4K, like, this is, like, pretty much the same. But then when you go down the stack to 1080p, then the Vcash starts pulling ahead. Which is typically expected because as you go down in resolution, you're becoming more CPU limited. I didn't want... Oh, I haven't watched Ancient Gameplay's video if he did one. Wait, Ancient Gameplay's did a video with... Ancient Gameplays did a review of three X three D. Hold on, AMD. AMD optimized resizable bar with game drivers were were Intel. And Nvidia have not put as much work into the game driver. Now that might change with Arc GPUs. Uh, I don't know. Like, I I'd have to verify these claims, or there has to be some source that verifies these claims that Sam. AMD plus AMD results in like some kind of special power up because I, I, I like I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that or they don't do that what I'm saying is like they really need to do more of that so if what you guys are saying is that AMD plus AMD results in a 20% uh, increase or whatever compared to like AMD plus Intel you know like wh why have why isn't this more well known <laughs> like there's not a lot of content showing this um, or at least I'm not aware of it. <clears throat> I mean, I, that would be cool if that was the case. I'd probably have to test this. Now, I think I know what I'm going to do, like, for one of my next videos. That's going to take a long time to make. I'm going to do Intel plus AMD versus AMD plus AMD. <laughs> and then AMD plus NVIDIA. <laughs> Just to kind of, well, because what do we need to look at here? We need to look at what's the scaling of SAM when you have AMD plus AMD. We obviously need to have AMD plus Intel to see what the resizable bar scaling is. And then we also need to kind of show like how, okay, SAM, uh, a Ryzen plus NVIDIA doesn't scale as much as Ryzen plus Radeon for some reason. And, and what you do is obviously you have to use like for like GPU. Testing 4090 and testing 7900 XTX is going to be a dumb comparison because there's too big of a gap between those two. We're talking like a 15 to 20% gap. So that's not a fair comparison. It would have to be like 3090 Ti and 7900 XT. Those are the proper comparisons. Those two GPUs are equivalent. So that's what I'll do. I'll do 3090 Ti versus like 3090 Ti plus Ryzen versus 7900 XT. Remember, 7900 XT, not XTX, because XTX is too fast. That wouldn't be fair. So we're doing 7900 XT plus Ryzen versus 3090 Ti plus Ryzen, because those two GPUs are equivalent in performance. That should be equivalent. So if we go back, uh, GPU... Uh, let's look at, where is it? Uh, where are you? 3090 Ti. 3090 Ti. Uh, bam. 7900 XTX, 100%, and 3090 Ti, 100%. They are equipped, why does this bar chart look like it's not, why does it look like the 700 XT is faster? And now it looks like that one's faster. This is kind of bugged. Anyway, these two are the same. Like, the, this and this and the 700 XT have equivalent uh, rasterization performance. Um, obviously, the 3090 Ti has four more gigabytes of VRAM, but that's really not going to matter here. So that's what I'll test to see, if, to see if these claims of SAM is correct. Wait, what? Ancient Gameplays might have done it. I've seen it too. Yeah, that was a leak. Wait, what? What is leaked? 
No, no. What are we talking about? I'm talking about Sam versus Rebar on an AMD GPU. It's done in that video. In who? Ancient Gameplay's video? AMD's own test with AMD GPU and NVIDIA didn't show those results. Search this. Do AMD GPU scale better with this? XTX plus this versus this. I've tested it. Okay. Uh, hold on. Let's, let me grab this thing. Um, do AMD this? STS? This guy? Who, I don't even know who this Last is. time, we had a look at this bad boy. AMD's latest flash. Are you talking about this one? RX 700 XTX GPU. Do scale better Ignoring with AMD? The Let's see. amount of X's in the same. I don't want to waste all of these numbers. So okay. if anybody so, is looking for hold a. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Okay, he did 700 XT. Okay, or 7700 7, X. 64 gigs of RAM. Okay, I like that. 1200 watt PSU. Okay, so his computer's not going to turn off on him randomly. Resizable bar enabled. FSR DLSS disabled. Yeah, because the way you would test this, this is going to be rasterization. So forget about RT. Forget about any sort of upscaler. You just literally run everything native and you do all the tests. Go a little bit further. Hold on. Okay, hold up. Performance increase relative to 3080 tie. Wait, what? What, hold, this isn't even like a proper test though. Why is he... What, 3080 Ti is so weak compared to an XTX. Like, obviously it's going to win. <laughs> like, what? That's what I just said earlier. You have to test, like, you have to test an NVIDIA GPU and an AMD GPU that are nearly equivalent. Oh, these are just raw results? What is this? Infinite? What do you do? You're reading it wrong, go further. Performance increase relative to... Hold on. Am I supposed to go to the end of the video? Okay, oh, hold on, okay, let's see, let's see. Here we go, here we go. What is this? This is, uh... Oh, okay, I see, I see. So the... What is he? What is the baseline? What are, what are these percentages relative to? Because what is this like? The f okay, so he's I see now. Okay, so Wow, Wow did eighteen percent. No, Wow did for the average FPS. Wow did twenty three percent better than what? Oh, then a 3080 tie. Okay, okay, I think I understand now. So he's saying that when he tested a 3080 tie on a 7700X, the XTX did 23% better than it in WoW. But then when he tested the same thing on the 13700, he only got 12%. So... So that means that... It did, okay, so that means that it did better in Ryzen. Okay, then what is this, though? Like, okay, what about, okay, but like, what about the 4090, though? The 4090 also benefited from Sam. Wait, what, what is this? Like, 55, okay, Metro Exodus Enhanced, 55%. Metro X, oh, 93%? <laughs> what, uh, 64 on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and then here it was like 96. Like, how, what? So you can see that the 4090 scale is better on Intel than it does on AMD. Yeah, but that doesn't say anything about Sam, though. That has nothing to do with Sam. Like, okay, let's look at the 4080. The 4080, 39... Like, this isn't a proper test. Like, why is he testing... Okay, I guess... Hold on, hold on a second. The 4080 is similar to the XTX. It's a little bit slower, but it's more closer than this thing. So, if we ignore the 4090, because that doesn't make any sense. Um, 
wow did hold on so wow okay so 4080 wow did five percent better on the 7700x but it did 27 so what is this saying like okay he's he's holding it relative to a 3080 ti why wouldn't he just like what i'm saying is why wouldn't he just compare it to like itself you, you get what i'm saying like why would he compare it to a 3080 ti why doesn't he just compare the results of a 7900 xtx uh, like why doesn't he compare wow like the wow result on the 13 plus xtx versus the 77 plus xtx why are we why do we have a middle gpu in here like well, I don't understand this. Like, why doesn't he just compare, like, the, you know, like, why make it confusing? You Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the problem with this result, the reason why this result is, not, is like, invalid is because the 3080 Ti, you have to factor in the 3080 Ti's own numbers. The 3080, now you have another variable. The problem with this test and the reason why it's invalid statistically is because when you take the 3080 Ti... And you, you're trying to compare the results of a GPU, like like in this case, XTX. Any of these three, doesn't matter. Just pick one of them, XTX. Because we're talking about SAM. XTX results versus 3080 Ti's results, but then now there's a whole nother CPU. Like that, that to me is an invalid test. You would want to test XTX results on 77 versus 13. That is the correct comparison. And like, what's the scaling there? And then what's the 4080's results compared with itself on those two CPUs? And then take that performance delta difference and then compare that to the XTX. Doing it this way normalizes the results. It's not normalizing the results. Because you have two because you have the 3080 Ti's results, which aren't shown. Everything's held to 100 percent for the 3080 Ti. But you have to remember the 3080 Ti's results are different on both CPUs also. Yes, it's different. So it's not it's not valid. So hold on, L hold on. Let me try to understand what his logic is. Basically, Let's understand. Let's see if we can understand his logic. FPS. Going to a 4080 got us 125 FPS. So the 40% increase we had in the beginning of this video. And now comes the point. For a 7700K, we are going from the same starting point of exactly 89 FPS on average. Yes, Shadow of the Tomb Raider performs plus minus 1% the same on a 7700X and 13700K, which is why I'm going with this as my baseline. It's it's amazing. Average FPS, 1% lows, everything is plus minus 1 FPS the same. It's amazing. Anyway, going to a 4080, we got a pump to 114 FPS, so the 28% increase. And these values are now extremely important because they are showing that although we are starting off at the same starting point, we got a bigger boost on Team Blue compared to Team Red. Again, CPU bottleneck, or are there more ways around it? See, but again, like he just said, right? Like, this could be just the difference in the cpus so what uh, my question to him is is there does he include the results with resizal bar disabled that's what i want to know where's the resizal bar disabled results if you're going to if you're going to use a third gpu in this case the 3080 ti as a baseline you also and, and if you're also trying to see if well, actually, hold on. I don't think he's trying to see if if uh, Sam. Yeah, this isn't even. Does this have nothing to do with Sam? Like, th is Sam enabled? Does he talk? Is this even a thing? The the title of the video doesn't even indicate that we're doing a resizable bar comparison. Like, this is more of just like a CPU comparison. 
on this graph, we average the number of every game to the EU's GPU. So we know that generally going from a 3080 Ti to a 4080 will give us a 28% boost in, in more average FPS on a 13700K and doing the same on a 7700X will give us only 13%. Going up to a 4090 will yield us a... Yeah, but what does this have to do with Sam? Because what I was saying earlier is, is Sam, right? Like... What? Does this have anything to do with Sam? Ridiculous 63. The conclusion is Sam? Frames and only roughly half that increase when going AMD. But here you can already see where I am going with this. On Intel, you will get a boost when going 4080 and another boost when going 4090. But then going to a 7900 XTX, which is actually the main topic of today's video, but wasn't mentioned for like the last five minutes. Anyway, going for a 7900 XTX, we get a major drop. So hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So I, I get what he's saying, but like, where's where's the part about the Sam? The 4090 is a whole different game. That the differences are enormous. But on a 7700 X, it is completely different. There, the 7900 XTX is actually the king of the 7700 X graph. Sure, the best case scenario seems still to be a 13700K in combination with a 4090. But the fact that the 7900 XTX does not scale somewhat the same on both sides already shows why. Why it's extremely important to take a look at more than just a single review from more than just a single uh, performance of a 3080 Ti full of Shadow of the Tomb Raider with the act a lot different. That's why. Hold I on. What I still don't understand is why. What was the reason for the 3080 Ti? Like, did he explain why he chose the 3080 Ti of all GPUs instead of just like comparing the results from both CPUs across two GPUs? Because why that GPU though? Averaging everything again. And because the thing is, like, if you choose, it just seems like such a random, arbitrary, like, wh why this one specifically? Again and again, and the more. And I don't understand, like, where's the Sam stuff? We are looking at 117 FPS, which is 31 percent higher than another 3080. Different now, games perform differently on different games. On or different ga what? You mean at different platforms? FPS average, which is a 35 percent increase. So looking at the bigger picture here, no. Oh, wait, 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 what he's saying? Okay. He's saying that this. So wait, did every test he do result in the similar test for thirty eighty Ti? Like, is it better to upgrade to a seventy nine hundred? I'm confused why he chose the thirty eighty Ti compared to a forty eighty. <laughs> why did he choose the thirty eighty Ti? <laughs> That's like the one graphics card that gives everybody who bought it buyer's remorse. <laughs> XCX upgrade on both systems. But there is, even on absolute numbers. <laughs> it's like, why did he choose 3080 Ti? Why didn't he just choose regular 3080? Now what's really interesting <laughs> here is Shadow of the Tomb Raider is not the only game that this has happened. Horizon Zero Dawn, Intel starting point, 89 FPS, going to 4080 gives us 114 FPS, and going RX 900 XTX, only 107 on average. Do the same thing on AMD and we- What, what is this negative 22 on the 4090? For far cry like what does this mean? Like relative to the 4080? So he's saying that that the 4090 does worse than a 3080 Ti by like 22%. And then on the Intel it's like minus what? <laughs> like at 88 going to only 87. <laughs> I'm confused. Why are there negative numbers? Like why are there negative percent scaling if you're comparing to a 3080 Ti? Which all three of these GPUs are significantly faster than the 3080 Ti. So why are there negative percentages here in the first place? And back to the <laughs> what is this? On an RX <laughs> because the games are scaling worse? Like, but do you understand? Negative, though, means it's doing worse. Like, negative percent versus 3080 Ti means that the 4090 is losing... Oh, wait, no, that's the 1%. Okay, that's the 1% low. Never mind. Oh, that means it's like... It's more s oh uh, well okay mind you the game performs overall roars on a seven hold on what's the conclusion numbers what is the conclusion speaking, considering that we benchmarked only six games and uh, everything this bar chart doesn't make sense that's what i'm saying like why why did he choose a 3080 tie like this is the most random it gpu seems like a to me this is more like a video that shows you like if you had a 3080 tie on one of these two cpus and you upgraded to one of these three gpus 
Like, this is supposed to show you, like, the best case combination relative to the 3080 tie. Like, what? Loses to this on force Apparently, Apparently, that is the case, and then the, the 4090 loses in Cyberpunk? Is better than going from or in, uh, to this one, although whatever this that one game was, <laughs> Far Cry? Damn close. <laughs> and why uh, is all of this? Smart access memory. <laughs> what? Sure, Reaper also exists on NVIDIA and Intel side, but as far as my own findings for now are concerned, Rebar seems to have a much bigger impact on AMD AMD systems that it can position the 7900 XTX above the 4080, which is pretty damn wild. If you haven't noticed, until now I have not well, 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 well. ray tracing options in all of this, and this is reason, because AMD sucks at it. If you were to do the same thing with 4K ray tracing enabled titles, the only two scenarios in which all of which we found would apply are Far Cry 6, which doesn't do a lot of ray tracing, and WoW, uh, the game that prefers 4080s above 4090s. So yeah, a <laughs> <laughs> Well yeah, you don't test ray tracing. If you're trying to do like this sort of comparison to see like smart access memory scaling, you wouldn't do ray tracing. So yeah, I, I agree with him there, but not for the reasons that he mentioned. But because like what he just showed with WoW on a 4080 being faster than a 4090 with RT. <laughs> and WoW, uh, the game... <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, what? Hold on, what is this? So, WoW RT. Oh, but these are absolutes. So this is not, this is not comparing it to the 3080 T. Wait, oh, there's a 3080 Ti. So, well, I mean, the thing is like, do these, do these numbers still make sense though? Like scale, like, uh, Where's 30? Okay, 3080, 151, 4080, 159, 4090, 156, but then on AMD, 3080, 171, 166, and 163. Well, guys, like, look. Look at what I was saying. Remember what I just said? Remember what I just said? Earlier on, I said that when you compare the GeForce with the, like, if you put GeForce with an AMD CPU, and then you put, take the same GeForce graphics card, and you put it on an Intel CPU, like, the, the Delta is not as, well, what's weird here to me, what's news to me is the fact that the AMD GPU actually, now it looks like it does actually scale better on the, well, at least this Zen 4 CPU. So when I was speaking earlier, I was talking more about older, like Zen 1, Zen 2, and then like Bulldozer and Vishera and all that stuff. So, but look, but even like this, right? Like, look at this. Like the GeForce card, 3080 Ti is doing 171 on, what is this? Is this the, what is the CPU? Oh, 1440. Okay, hold on. Where's the... Oh, this is the 77. Okay, never mind. Never mind. What am I talking about? For some reason, I thought this... Okay, never mind. ...prefers 4080s above 4090s. So yeah, an AMD-AMD combination seems to scale better than an Intel-AMD combination or a AMD-NVIDIA combination as long as rasterization is concerned. But okay, this should be it for today's adventure into my Excel skill set. I hope you found this... Well, I don't... Uh, the thing is, this doesn't really say... I mean... He's just kind of saying that, okay, it's smart access memory. But the problem with this test, he's just kind of default concluding that, oh, it's SAM. The thing is, he didn't actually show any tests without SAM. Or did he? If he did, then I'd, uh, you know, I'd need to probably watch the whole video. But, like, the thing is, he didn't show SAM on or off. Like, was this SAM on? I guess it was. I guess, I guess I'm, I'm assuming resizable bar was turned on the whole time for both for all the tests it was all sam okay yeah I, I assume that it had to be otherwise how would his conclusion have any bearing at all but it would have been nice to see like what the sam results turned off are that that's what i'm curious to know 
That is a really interesting video idea, though. You know what I'm, I'm thinking? Like, I could do... See, what I could do... I could do 30-90 tie. Or, I mean, I could also do 30-80 tie. Uh, but if I do 30-80 tie, I need to test with a 6900 XT or a 6950 XT. If I test with 3090 Ti, then I have to test with a 7900 XT because those two GPUs are the same rasterization wise. So I, I'm thinking I would do that because those two are actually, I think those two are closer together than the, uh... yeah, well, mm, 6950 XT is literally the same as a 3080 tie. Yeah. 100%, 100%. So these two, these two are the same. 6950 XT. So I could do either one. I could do like, I could test 3080 tie uh, and 6950 XT. I could test, uh, you know, with, well, I think the easiest thing to do would be to just test smart access memory. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't even test with the Intel CPU. Just test with the Ryzen CPU, like a 7700X. Basically, do what this guy did, except forget about, like, the Intel CPU. Just test with both graphics cards on the Ryzen CPU. Turn SAM off, do the test. Turn SAM on, do the test. And then, like, look at what the scaling looks like. That would be the thing, right? Like, that would show you, like, if it... If it... Wait... NVIDIA resizable bar tested as good as AMD SAM. Search that it's from hardware unboxed. Is that an old video? Because I'm wondering now, because these new CPUs seem to be a lot different from what I thought. Hardware unboxed oh, one year ago. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see here. So what did he do? He tested... He tested proof by just three uh, percent at fourteen forty p. Certainly not nothing, but not nearly as exciting as what the just see the comparison indicated. Still, overall, it was a net gain. Hold on, what did he no what did he use as the test setup? The future is versus, developed uh, design games with a resizable bar in mind. That being the case, at some point, in video would need. And to what is he testing? Resizable bar train. Hold on, well, I need to know what he's testing things. because it's like he has to be testing things that are similar in performance, like. Testing two GPUs that are way too different isn't going to be an accurate test. So 3070 and 30... Or, okay, wait, what? So... Oh, this is like the SAM well, stuff. Was very okay. In, the way of a performance boost scene. in the end, when testing across a large sample of games, we found... SAM on turned on versus turned off. 3% 3 faster in 1440p on a Radeon. Not nearly as exciting as what the initial testing... And he's doing... What's the CPU that he's testing Still, with? Overall, it was a net gain and would no doubt play a more important role in the future as did nothing to achieve them. However, a deeper Hold dive into SAM going? revealed a number of instant... Required V bar, so it's 3060 Ti, 3070, 3080, and 3090 owners who will need to upgrade their V bars. For my test, I'm using the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 3080 OC, and the process here for updating the V bars couldn't have been any easier. I simply navigated to the support tab on by X570 Unify. X. A okay, hold. Oh, he's doing X570. So that means it's gonna be Zen 2 or Zen 3. It's a 9 5950X. 5950X. Okay, that's all I need to know. To so now let's look at the comparison. 9% at 1440p. So some pretty nice gains there. So what is this? Not this is a uh, resizable bar on Nvidia. GPUs in this tile. This is the 3070. 8 to 9% is certainly nothing to sneeze that's, at. That seems pretty good. Though, where we need a performance boost the most at 4K, we're looking at basically nothing. Good result. Okay, at 1080p, that's good. At an eleven percent performance boost, nine. Horizon. Five percent at forty. That one's good. That one's usually very PCI bandwidth heavy. Forty p. Borderlands is still. You're still, still seeing. As I've already said, this is free performance. Okay, that so looks good. Games, Cyberpunk. Four K would have been nice. That one's good. So we'd only be talking about a four K. The reason why you're not going to see anything in four K is because now, the GPU is just bottlenecked completely by itself. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, where performance went virtually unchanged. So the here, it didn't really do much. If we're to believe okay. NVIDIA's claims, we could be looking at a situation... Watch Dogs. Watch Dogs did not benefit at all on NVIDIA with resizable bar. 
or a massive there's a pe- there's a performance penalty performance although 4k it's still result. better but then again like again these results were there it seems like it's bottleneck we saw a steep decline in one percent low performance with resizable bar enabled in watchdogs legion and we're not alone with these findings either Other okay 20 game average as i test and rather than spend a lot more time going over so the data wait 20 game average, average no, barely any difference 20 games well, we just saw a whole also bunch of differences per game breakdown in a moment but i wanted to show you this graph first as we just saw a whole bunch of differences and now he's saying there's no differences and value of gpus whereas we saw a three percent every game that we saw had a difference GPUs, some of them had negative scaling though like is it cancelled out for the rtx 3080 at 1080p a one percent gain at 1440p he splits them at the end up a two percent there are indeed performance regression. Same at 1080. Nvidia claims that they use game. Okay, Pro Death Stranding, Watchdog Legions, and Far Cry don't scale, and then Forza, Forza, Forza Horizon 4, the Division Assassin's example, Creed, and Cyberpunk do, and Borderlands. And therefore, the game profile should automatically disable. I'm sur- surprised Horizon Zero Dawn didn't scale that much. With but that's Sam. simply not the case, and we found the same issue in multiple titles were highly repeatable okay it's a shame because had nvidia achieved what they claimed there'd be no drawback to enabling resizable bar. okay one percent faster yeah that's margin, the margin of error almost uh, this one okay yeah the one to two percent drop off okay let's take let's take a look let's take a look here we go okay here we go percentage differences here we go resizable bar turn on versus turned off with my radio rx 6800 testing um which is 18 of the 20 games just tested, this is how the GeForce RTX 3080 and RX 6800 compare. Basically, whereas Nvidia saw a 1% improvement on average, AMD saw a 7% improvement, which isn't that surprising given AMD often saw much larger gains. Man, some of the Nvidia ones have negative scaling. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Hitman 2, Borderlands <laughs> what's, 3, funny is, uh, what's funny is Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order has negative 2% with resizable with Sam on AMD. But it has one one percent one percent on. Oh, it's thirty eighty. Why is he comparing thirty eighty? This is the wrong GPU. Like it should be thirty seventy Ti. If you're gonna compare six eight hundred, it should be thirty seventy Ti. Otherwise, this should be six eight hundred XT. If you're comparing thirty eighty, this is the technically it's wrong. I mean, they're different performance tier, but whatever. It's kind of close. In fact, from this game's list, AMD only saw a performance decline in a single game. A small 2% drop in Star Wars Jedi. But the problem is the Star Wars one is like so margin of error at that low percent that it's probably well, doesn't even matter. So as it stands, AMD appears Same thing to with Cyberpunk though. Their resizable bar support, which makes sense given they developed the Radeon RX 6000 series with it in mind. Whereas it's quite clearly been an after. Okay, what this tells me, so so thank you for sharing this video uh, because this is actually really interesting because this 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 indicates to me that um, a couple of things here is the the resizable bar technology. This to me indicates that when AMD was developing RDNA 2 before the RDNA 2 GPUs were even available. They had already planned to utilize resizable bar as a feature in order to give them a performance boost on the Radeon cards. So what this means is that this is a combination of two things. One, the architecture itself can benefit from the variable burst width of the uh not packets but they're kind of like packets in a router uh, basically the 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 data that goes across the pcie bus instead of it being in a fixed 256 byte or bit i think it's byte window um now it can be variable up to 4096 bytes so the variable length of the uh i guess pcie data frames or whatever they are uh is better or or in in this case rdna2 can utilize the variable length better than the ampere geforce 30 series cards that's what this tells me and nvidia disables rebar on some titles even though they have better performance with it on you mean megabytes? Okay, yeah. Yeah. That's where NVIDIA Inspector comes in handy. 
I haven't used NVIDIA Inspector since the days of my GTX 970. I remember that program. That program is old school. Finally, Radeon Resizable Bar Benchmark, AMD and Intel platform performance. Although, you know, this makes me wonder, though, like, what about... Okay, here's the thing, though. Like, now the perfect video would be to, like, do this exact same test on the Intel, like, Rocket Lake. Because this is done on Zen 3. So, like, you want to test this on 11th Gen Intel to get similar... Because remember, it, the thi ideally, you want to rule out like significant differences inherent in the performance of a processor and a GPU. Which means, ideally, if you want to see how well it scales, you want a graphics card that is very similar to another graphics card. So in this case, like 7900 XT versus 3090 Ti. You know, or... This is what he did is fine, except he, if he wanted like better, more accurate results, he should have tested with a 6800 XT versus 3080, or he should have done 6800 versus 3070 tie because that's more like for like. Um, but yeah, like any, any two GPUs that are very close in performance, when I say very close in performance, I mean plus or minus 5%. And then when I say CPU, same thing. CPU, you want the two CPUs being compared to be plus or minus 5% in terms of the performance. So like if we're talking about a, um, like a 13900K, if someone's gonna test with one of those, they would have to test with a 7950X 3D. Um, or if they're testing with a 7950X, then they're probably going to test with like a 13700K or a 12900K. Um, one of those, like that, that you you want to you want to like rule out like very like too much variance because too like the product inherently being faster than the other. If you want to see like the the most accurate scaling on resizable bar, so I might actually do something like that. I'm I'm thinking about it. Like uh, this is something that I think is 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 underrepresented in the tech world like in terms of the gaming tech world i think like it's it's worth retesting resizable bar like on newer cpus uh and and like for like rasterization on the gpus so in my case like i was saying earlier the two gpus that i have that are the most similar in spec well there's two i have 6950 xt and 3080 Ti, and then I also have 7900 XT and 3090 Ti. So I'm probably going to pick one of those two pairs, and I'm going to compare... Uh, well, I think what I'll do is kind of do what he did. Test it on there and see if there's any... Diff well, mm, I don't know. Like, it's probably going to be very similar to what he got. So that would just be duplicating the work. Um, although the test, the games that I would test would be different, because I don't have a lot of these games. I don't have Assassin's Creed. I I don't know if I have Hitman. I have Borderlands 3. Um, I have Godfall. I don't know if I have Dirt 5. I have The Division 2, I think. I don't have Resident Evil 3. I have Horizon Zero Dawn. I don't have Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. I don't have World War Z. I don't have Gears 5. I have Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I do not have Watch Dogs Legion. I don't have F1. I, don't, I think I have Wolfenstein Youngblood. I have Death Stranding. I do. Mm, I don't have Cyberpunk, and I I do have Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. So I could do most of these tests, but not all of them. I could do probably like half, or maybe half to a two thirds. But the reality is simple. You can no longer directly compare, and instead we as humans try to force everything into boxes. Yeah, I guess, uh, well, he, he, I mean, I, I guess he's going to say... They're disabling it in games that see a performance regression. Yeah, I guess he's saying that, like, shame, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, based on his test, I can see why people would believe sword. that uh, that the uh, SAM works better on AMD. And, and that's good to know, because that does tell me that uh, it, means, it means that AMD designed RDNA 2 to benefit from SAM, or resizable bar, better than 
previous architectures because you know this almost makes me wonder you know how well does vega 64 or radeon 7 or the 5700 xt benefit from resizable bar because i know you can turn it on for those gpus uh, i don't know how well they'll scale like this gpu did but uh, you can turn it on on the older gpus Which one pairs with what to get the most benefit or benefit? They only just added it with these latest drivers. Well, no, Sam Sam came around when RDNA 2 launched. So that was like 2020. Sam's been around since 2020. Uh, but I'm saying, like, you can run Sam on a RDNA 1 5700X T. Like, I don't know how much it will scale like this, because it probably wasn't designed to benefit from it. So it might end up, oh, Sam only now works on the R, oh, the old, okay. So you've, the dumbest thing you've seen people do is compare consoles to NVIDIA GPUs when they only compare to AMD. Yeah, the, I mean, and see, that's just, that's just the general public not knowing what AMD GPUs are, like, that's just people not understanding, like, what the equivalent AMD GPU is to a given NVIDIA GPU. But yeah, you're right. Like, technically, it it's you're comparing, like, apples and oranges when you're trying to compare a console to an NVIDIA graphics card. But the thing is, you can still kind of approximate it, though, based off of the performance tier. So even though it's, it's technically wrong, they still can do it, and it'll still be an accurate comparison. It's just not like, yeah... It, no, I, I know what you're saying. Because the consoles are RDNA 2 based, yeah. Um, but I think that's pretty much all that I had. Like, I didn't really have much more to say. Um, in terms of whether or not I'm going to get one of these 3D, I don't know. Um... I think someone, I think Joey had asked me if I was going to get one of these X3D CPUs for testing for tomorrow. I honestly, guys, I don't really know if I really need one of these. Um, it's, I'm I will say, like, I am kind of curious. I, I'm interested in playing around with it to see, like, what you can do with Curve Optimizer, uh, PBO, uh, the, like people were talking earlier like what happens if you tune the ram but you also have access to the vcache like does that help um in theory you would think that a dual ccd chip will stand to benefit more than like a 7800 x3d but there were those anecdotal uh comments earlier about the 5800 x3d benefiting from tuned ram so who knows like let's pro it sounds like it probably would benefit dramatically The reality is if you avoid CPU limits on an NVIDIA card, either Intel or AMD seem to be fine. Yeah, I mean, so generally speaking, the 7900 XTX is going to perform better on AMD than Intel. Yeah, it and it's good to see those results because you would, you would think that, you know, AMD, since they make the graphics card and the CPU, they would try to optimize it to work better together. So, yeah. Um, I just feel like, I just feel like AMD hasn't really done a good job marketing that or just kind of like getting the word out that that's a thing, you know, like, I don't know, like up until I guess Zen 3, uh, AMD had always, like Radeon cards had always scaled really well on Intel CPUs, although Intel CPUs have changed over the years. It's one of those things where it's like, I wonder... If because I know I wasn't imagining this when I I remember playing Final Fantasy fourteen Heaven Sword back in twenty fifteen on my GTX nine seventy paired up with my FX eighty three fifty Vishera pile driver AMD CPU and I could get the same performance on that CPU in Limza Lominza compared to what I would get on a i7 4770K paired up with a, a R9 290X. 
So I had a Radeon, uh, what is that, GCN 2.0, so second gen GCN, Hawaii, like R9290X, versus FX8350 plus GTX 970. And I remember the performance was basically the same. So, but but the thing, things are different now. I, I recognize that things are different now. Obviously, like, RDNA 3 is out now. RDNA 2 is still a thing. Ampere is still a thing. Ada is now out. And then, of course, Intel's architecture today on, like, 11th, 12th, and 13th gen is a different architecture than the old Skylake era. And, like, even if you go further back, you know, like, Haswell and the other stuff. So, and then, of course, Zen is vastly different from Bulldozer. So, um, yeah. So, I guess, I guess, uh, I, I probably do need to do a video to test that. I need to test these things to see, like, how the newer architecture scales between GeForce Radeon uh, with Resizable Bar. So, what do I think of Atomic Hearts? I have not had a chance to play that game at all or even to, like look at it so uh, it's an interesting looking game um, <clears throat> but I, I don't have any plans to get it right now like like the problem for me is I still have to finish Hogwarts Legacy I still have to finish well I don't know if I'm gonna finish Forspoken anymore I, I kind of gave up on that game that game is really just a benchmark tool now <laughs> I mean that's really what it's become um, but yeah, like I need to finish Hogwarts Legacy and then I do want to play uh, Wolong Fallen Dynasty when it comes out this Friday. So I played the demo on stream like last week and that was pretty fun. So I'm kind of hyped for that game. So that's going to be the next game in the pipeline. And then after that, the next game that I will be covering on stream is going to be Fatal Frame Mask of the Lunar Eclipse. And then, and then after that, it might be Resident Evil 4. So if you like scary type of games then, um, you know, uh, stay tuned for those, because I think we might be covering that in the next couple of weeks. I think I would prefer Atomic Hearts over Hogwarts. Yeah, Atomic Hearts looks good, but I don't know. I, I already have Hogwarts Legacy. I need to finish Hogwarts Legacy. And then I already had plans for those other games that I just mentioned, so that's kind of why... Atomic Hearts just kind of, like, got squeezed out. Out of the line, so to speak. You can't play it on Sony. Yeah, you can. I played it. I, I was I streamed it, like, last uh, Friday, I think. Or was it Thursday? You can, There's the bug. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. There's, like, the Disco Light bug. But that was in Wild Hearts. That's going to be patched out, though. Because they had to patch that. They had to fix it uh, for Wild Hearts. So they're going to have to fix the same thing. It's basically screen space reflections is bugged. See, I think the problem with these recent games that come out and the 7000 series have these weird issues is because these developers probably didn't have those RDNA 3 GPUs before they had the game ready for release. I think that's what ended up happening. So... Because apparently, from what I heard, is... AMD, so the reason why the, the driver fork was split for between RDNA 3 and RDNA 2 is because somewhere for the, the driver kernel for RDNA 3 was partially rewritten, and that's the reason why we're seeing these bugs manifest on the 7900 cards. So it's unfortunate, but it's going to be one of those things where it's like, until those developers like have those GPUs in hand to test... Um, before they release a game, st stuff like that might end up happening. Unless uh, AMD has to fix it on the driver's side. But it's one of those things where it's like, I think the developers are going to have to fix those things. Bec in the case of uh, Omega Force, they fixed it. What is what is such a facepalm in my mind was the fact that like Omega Force fixed it. But then they didn't go and tell like Team Ninja, hey, heads up. Both of our games, Wild Hearts and Wolong, use the exact same game engine. We found a bug with the 7900 cards. We fixed it. Uh, you might want to check if the bug exists in Wolong. And it's like, well, did they do it? No, apparently not. At least not for the demo. Um, but the, the, like, the day one release for the actual game on Friday is probably going to include the fix. I would assume because it's probably been reported multiple times from multiple people. So...
But that's the problem when, you know, like the GPU launched in what? December and these games were done probably in October. Because some people, like some reviewers already re reviewed Wolong back in January. From what I was told. Like when I was streaming the demo, um, you know, somebody came in the chat and they mentioned that they were a reviewer and they had already reviewed the game um, a few weeks ago. So it's like, yeah, okay. Uh, that tells me like, yeah, that means they had the, the review copy which means that the game was done in like October, um, which which means that explains why the the first playable demo on the PS5 was back in like October, late September I think, or somewhere somewhere around there. It was like a while ago. So so basically, the game was completed before the 7900 XTX existed. And these game studios didn't bother to test the game after the fact. So anyway, they do a lazy job of implementing certain features like ray tracing, for example. is not done correctly for these games that come out to console. It's always going to be a resource thing. Like a lot of these games, a lot of these games that have come out this year are very, they feel very, uh, I don't want to say unfinished. But they feel very unoptimized. Well, I hate using the word optimized because every single time people complain about a PC port, they always talk about it's not optimized. I, I wouldn't say it's not optimized. It's more so like the developers of a lot of these games are just like not keeping up with technology. I feel I feel like that. I don't I don't know how else to say it. Thankfully, Hogwarts Legacy, though, actually seems like it's pretty solid. Compared to a lot of these other games that released alongside it. It's the only one that I've played. Let's put it this way. Out of all, all the games that have come out this year and the ones that I have played, Hogwarts Legacy is the only one that didn't have, like, significant problems. Like, there was, there was like, two problems. There was, like, an AI problem, like, day one. That they had to fix like two days later. And then there was like a problem with the uh, 7900 series cards rendering the LOD on the plants. Some of the plants were rendered like white. But they had to fix that problem, right? Like, And that, that I think goes back to the same problem with the disco lights on Wild Hearts. It's the difference in the kernel. I don't know why AMD rewrote it. I, I guess it's because of the MCD architecture. Um... But that's one of those things where it's like either the devs have to get access to the hardware to test or, you know, AMD has to fix on the driver's side, which is, I don't, I don't know which is the better approach. I really think that the more you can have the developers do on their end is the better approach, but that's, that's uh, easier said than done because they have such limited resources. Maybe. You may have a point there. But the thing is, like, really the only thing that I've seen is, like, screen space reflections. SSR, right? That's the only thing that I have seen break in several of these recent games. The consoles can't handle full path tracing, based ray tracing in Hogwarts Legacy, for example. AA is broken into a bunch of games. Well, remember how Forspoken... Forspoken was so unnecessarily hard to run at launch. And in fact, I think it still is. The devs promised to optimize that game, but uh, so far they haven't done anything. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I don't know when we're going to get the Forspoken patch to fix a lot of the performance problems. But man, I remember that game. Forspoken was so hard to run. Like, insanely hard to run at launch. Like, I mean, you guys saw the live stream. Like, remember Intel Arc? Intel Arc couldn't even handle the game at 1440p. Like, at standard settings. And then I, I had to turn on, like, XESS or FSR. And it still didn't really help. Like, it helped, but it didn't really make it, like, really, really good to play. <laughs> you would still see it dip, like, into the 40s. <laughs> I don't know. 
I mean, it's using direct storage. I mean, I, like, I did a video. Like, part of the reason why I got the PCI Gen 5 SSD was to test, like, direct storage. And Forspoken does actually scale with PCI Gen 5. <laughs> like, I don't know why, because, uh, you know, the direct storage, why would that make your FPS go up? But for some reason, it does. <laughs> like, it literally does. Like, I have a video showing it. I tested PCI Gen 5, PCI Gen 3, and the old school SATA SSD. And the what you'll find in that video is PCI Gen 5 not only does it have the fastest load, it's like qu the quickest to load, it also has the best, uh, highest average FPS. But then the second best, the second best FPS is SATA. SATA has, like, I think, if I remember correctly, PCI Gen 5, the average FPS was... 83 fps the average for sata was 80 fps then the average for pci gen 3 was like 78 fps same gpu same cpu everything like the only thing i did was i moved the game like i moved the install folder from like using steam i literally moved the uh game between the different drives so like i moved it to gen 5 did the test moved it to gen 3 did the test then moved it to SATA and did the test, and I got three different results every time. In fact, I did I did uh, uh, two runs. No, three runs. Yeah, I did I did three runs for the two PCIe, and I did two runs for SATA. But the SATA, this I took the best result for all three. And like in the case of the worst result, the worst result, the PCI Gen three did seventy five FPS, and the SATA the wor the worst result for SATA. There's only two tests. It did 80, and then it did, I think, 79 or 78. So it was, like, super close. And then PCI Gen 5 was, like, 83 and 81. So I was like, uh, okay. It's it's beating SATA in every scenario, but, like, the worst-case scenario for PCI Gen 5 was literally, like, one FPS higher than the best-case scenario for SATA. So I, I don't know. Like, how big does that matter? What did matter was the load times, though. Like, the load times on Gen 5 versus SATA were significant. And they were also slightly faster than Gen 3. But they weren't like insane crazy fast compared to Gen 3. So it's almost one of those things where it's like if I tested Gen 4, Gen 4 would probably land like smack dab right in the middle between Gen 3 and Gen 5 to the point where it would just kind of like make the results look almost pointless. So, so yeah. But I mean, the whole point of me having Gen 5 say or... Gen 5 NVMe so that I can actually do, like, Gen 5 comparisons now. Or I can actually benchmark games with a Gen 5 SSD so I don't have to worry about it taking forever to load the different scenes if I'm doing, a, like, a benchmark run, for instance. Devs are focusing too much on scenes so they can advertise to sell the game and not the gameplay or optimize. Well, the problem is when you see gameplay or when you see quote unquote uh, upcoming game trailers, like oftentimes those those trailers are not actual like in-game footage. Oftentimes it's like a it's like a pre-rendered cutscene to make it look like gameplay, but it's actually not gameplay. And I think the Forspoken footage that we saw years ago was not actual gameplay footage. It was like a pre-rendered cutscene. That they made it look like it was a game. Gameplay footage. Hogwarts Legacy runs fine on Intel Arc. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, Hogwarts Legacy is actually a pretty good game. But you would be surprised. Like, a lot of people... A lot of people that watched my GTX 1080 Hogwarts Legacy uh, analysis video... I got a lot of, like... Uh, mixed comments on that video but I got a lot of negative comments on the 3080 Ti analysis video um, <clears throat> a lot of people were complaining about like well a lot most of the comments were that were that were uh, negative were complaining about Nvidia being cheap on VRAM and uh, I said it in the previous stream like somebody kept trying to say that like, there's some conspiracy where Nvidia has back backdoor deals with developers like I think the comment's still in that video, but someone was trying to say, like, NVIDIA has backhanded deals with uh, developers to raise the VRAM usage. 
on purpose so that gamers would be forced to upgrade graphics cards. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because if, if NVIDIA actually did that, like, then people would just realize that the, like, an older AMD card versus an older NVIDIA card, like, the higher VRAM on the AMD card would just make it look better. So there's no way that that's an actual thing. Like, the, like it's some kind of hot take, but it's like, yeah, no, that's complete nonsense. And NVIDIA wouldn't do something dumb like that. All right, Gold Bullets. Yep, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, we're about to end the stream too anyway. it's I, I've gone like way longer than I thought I would. Um, and I, I've talked about all the things that I wanted to talk about was just strictly like the X3D stuff. Um, hot take, but forespoken to proof that game design is hard. They made certain decisions early on and committed but never found the fun. Yeah. Yeah. But the VRAM stuff, though, like, the thing is, I don't think NVIDIA's doing, NVIDIA's totally not doing that, but the thing is, uh, I'm just a little, I'm wondering, you know, what are the upcoming GeForce cards going to have for VRAM? Like, the, the 4060, for instance, how much VRAM is that going to have? Is it going to be 12? Or is that going to be 8? Um, or is it going to be 10? You know, they could also do 10, because the 3080 was 10. Uh, 8? Is it really going to be 8? Do we actually know? And then, like, the AMD ones. Because AMD, we should be getting an announcement soon from either one of them for a mid-range card. We're coming up on, like, the time where you're going to hear an announcement for an upcoming Radeon or GeForce card. Because how many months has it been? So, like, 40... Okay, 4070 Ti was the most recent GPU. That was January. So, around April. Or April, we should be getting an announcement for a GPU coming in May, June time frame from NVIDIA. And then for AMD, the last GPU was December. The XTX and the XT. So, that means, like, AMD should be announcing a GPU sometime in March or April as well for possibly May or June launch. Yeah, so, oh man. See, the problem is they're going to be launching around the same time. That's when it's kind of dumb. Like, when they launch together, it's it's kind of dumb because it... I, I would prefer, like, if these two graphics card companies would stagger their product lines further apart from each other, like how it used to be, uh, what year is it? It is currently 2023. So technically, this is an AMD Radeon year. Because, a like I said in a previous video, when I drew the entire uh, release timeline for everybody watching the stream, odd years historically are AMD Radeon years. Even years are GeForce years. So last year was supposed to be the ADA year. Um, but NVIDIA only launched, you know, 4090 and 4080. Then they unlaunched fake 4080 and then relaunched it at the start of this year. So now we're stuck waiting on, you know, the 60 stuff. So, and then AMD launched their XTX and XT at the very end of last year. Just like with the 7970 XT back in 2011. Which means, like, AMD should be announcing their 800 stuff, like, really, really soon. Because typically, like, if we go by AMD's historical release window, technically, we should be getting, we're supposed to get, like, 7800 XT and whatever, like, next month. Like, March. Literally March. But, I don't think that's going to happen. Because they still have a lot of, like, 6800, I guess, and, and, and 6750 XT. And more importantly, 6950 XT. And once they sell through more of those, then they're more inclined to announce something. So I think we're going to see probably an announcement either late March for like a May launch window. Otherwise, we're going to hear an announcement for a Radeon GPU in, a, in April with a launch again in like sometime in the second half of May to, through June, if I had to guess. Because June is also going to be like like a Computex month. So that makes more sense to launch GPUs around that time. So yeah, I expect some Radeon GPUs soon. 
And then the NVIDIA stuff, I have no idea because NVIDIA still seems to have a lot of like 3060, 3060 Ti and those things. So, yeah, it's going to be kind of weird. It won't be announced before the 7800X 3D release. I mean, maybe. So in that case, it'll be announced. Yeah, but see, it could still be announced like in April. Because the 7800X 3D is like the beginning of April. 3 gigabyte, 1060, 4 gig, 30, 50, 8 gig, 30. Uh, well, 1060 is kind of not a thing, but uh, by today's standards. But 3050, 3050, 3070. See, the problem is NVIDIA still has so much 3050 all the way up to like 3070 Ti that they have to sell through. And so they they're they're kind of holding the line because the 4070 tie is literally just a 3080 tie. It's it's like a tiny bit faster than 3080 tie, and it's same amount of RAM as a 3080 tie. So it's like, why would you launch a 4070? Uh, if you literally have 3070 Ti, like right underneath 4070 Ti. See, so th there's, there's kind of a problem for NVIDIA. NVIDIA needs to sell through more Ampere stock. <clears throat> NVIDIA wants you to buy more Ampere stock before they're going to announce anything. People that buy new CPUs buy GPUs, so they will sell more. I guess, but, do, like, yeah, but people who typically do that are doing that during the holiday season. A lot of people bought new CPUs during the holiday season with GPUs. Typically, what I've seen is people who buy graphics cards um, outside of the holiday window will typically only buy the GPU. They're not going to do a full system build in the middle of the year. Now, I could be wrong. There's not, I'm not saying people don't do that. But what I've noticed is when somebody decides to upgrade a graphics card, that's literally the only thing they upgrade. They don't upgrade the CPU at the same time because they're trying to reduce the amount of upfront cost. Because when you do the full upgrade all at once, it's just really, really expensive. So they tend to like do things in stages. <clears throat> at least the people that I have helped upgrade components in the past they usually do them stage they don't do them all at once like my friend that i upgrade i helped him upgrade to a 5800 x3d last year back in like may he kept his gtx 1080 he didn't upgrade his graphics card until last uh november during the black friday deals he went and bought the the new egg deal for that 6800 xt for like three for like 535 dollars with the two free games that was when he upgraded the GPU. But see, he upgraded the CPU like earlier in the year. So they were staggered. Generally, you see one CPU for two to three GPU. We'll use a single CPU for two to three GPU upgrades. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Yeah. Because like, I mean, just using my friend as an example, he had a... Um, well, I don't know what the first GPU was, but he had a, uh, a, a an Intel Core i7 4790K, so the Haswell Devil's Canyon from 2014. He had that, and then he had some like old GPU, you know, like some really old GPU, like uh, either some Radeon 7850 or or some GTX 660 Ti or something or whatever. And then he went to a, uh, I think, he, so he had that when he upgraded the CPU. So that's like the first GPU on that CPU. Then he upgraded to the GTX 1080. Uh, so that's like the second GPU on that platform. Well, actually, no. I think he had like a, he had like some, oh, he had a GTX 460. He, yeah, he had a GTX 460 had that 4790k then he got like a, a gtx 770 and then he went to a gtx 1080 so yeah like three cpus three gpus on that cpu platform 
Then he upgraded to the Ryzen 5800X 3D. And then still had the 1080. And then got the 6800XT. So, so that's like two GPUs on that one CPU already. Each, uh, you had 980 tie till the 6900 came out. Yeah. Wait, uh -huh, yeah, worst platform I ever dive into. I7, 7900X, 128, and 2, I only used it for a single gen. Oh, but see, 7900X, you mean, you mean 7900K. Oh, wait, 7900X? Was it 7900X? I think it's 7900K. Oh, wait, no, 5960X was an Intel thing. Yeah, 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 uh, Cabby, uh, Skylake X, Skylake X. Yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's Skylake X. That's, uh, yeah, 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 X299, I know exactly what platform you're talking about. That was the very last Intel HDT platform that, that basically died off. Oh, no, that's not the last one. Wait, is it? No, that's, uh... Was that X299 or was that X99? That's X2... That's X299. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's X299. That's the one that competed with Threadripper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know which one that is. Skylake X. Yeah, X299. The one that had, like, a bunch of... Oh, no, actually, no. I'm thinking of X99. X99 had a lot of DDR4 problems at launch. I remember DDR4. Uh, you couldn't go beyond, like, 2666 DDR4 on Haswell E. Like, it didn't... Like, it was not stable. I knew somebody that built a Haswell E. X99. Worst platform for trying to run, like, high-speed DDR4. But again, now, granted, to give Intel the benefit of the doubt, that was the very first DDR4 platform in the consumer desktop space. So... So everybody complaining about, like, Ryzen not being able to do, like, above 6,000 reliably... Man, these people, t these people have not built enough PCs. <laughs> like, they don't know how it was, like, on the old school. Like, the, the early days of DDR4 were worse. They were straight up worse. i5 4 cores, Skylake X, that always made me laugh. Oh, wait a minute, 700, is that the Cabby Lake X? Is that the Cabby Lake X? Because remember there was Skylake X, which was the big one? No, that's the big 10 core, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the quad core Cabby Lake X. Quad core Cabby Lake X was the big disappointment. Cabby Lake X. Oh, then we have to end the stream because this is going way too beyond. Like, hold on, let me find. Here it is. Here it is. Hold up. Here it is. Cabby Lake X. This is it. Intel's. It was one of the high-end desktops, 14 nanometer plus, serving as a successor to Bravo E and a contemporary to Skylake X. Skylake X was the big one. Cabby Lake X was the joke. <laughs> Cabby Lake X was the meme. Wasn't this like the quad core on HEDT? Was this the quad core? Where is this thing? They don't want to tell me how many cores was on it because it's so embarrassing. <laughs> the Cavi Lake X was the really, really bad one. It was the quad core. That's all I remember. And it was terrible. The 7740X. Oh, wait, no, wait. Why are there... Okay, 70... These, this, this is it. There it is, guys. Fo Look at this. i5 7640X. Uh, quad core... Quad core with no hyper threading, <laughs> four core, four thread, 112 watt frequency. This thing would be beat by like every i3 that exists today, except maybe like the dual core Celeron. And even then, it probably will still lose to a dual core Celeron. Like an Alder Lake Celeron will beat like this thing. <laughs> and, and this thing's like on a. On a an HDT motherboard, this thing's on like a five hundred dollar motherboard, and it loses to like a Celeron 
on on like a, a cheap B six sixty M or something. <laughs> HDT quad core with no hybrid. Who what, like who is this for? <laughs> Who is this? And this released in okay. This released in June of 2017. This thing is younger than like first gen Ryzen. Th this thing is newer than Ryzen Zen One. Ryzen Zen One was like March of 2017, and this thing is like end of June 2017. This thing came out after Ryzen, and it's on HDT, and it's only a quad core with with no hyper threading. <laughs> For when you need 256 gigabytes of RAM on your quad. <laughs> yes, because that's so that's so practical. That's so practical, right? That's 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 so practical. 64 gigs of RAM. That's like 64 gigs of RAM per uh, core. Like that's so bad. <laughs> when Gordon asked the Intel guy why they why they are that CPU, or why that CPU exists, the Intel guy said, it's, it's a holdover to upgrade later. <laughs> can you imagine, can you imagine, like, <laughs> that's the, like, that's like one of the most dreaded questions to ask, like, a sales guy, a marketing guy from Intel. Like, having, having to answer that type of question, to hold you over to upgrade later. You were using RAM disk to install games? You had Battlefield 3 on a RAM disk? That's, I mean, yeah, but like, why not, uh, why not Sky Lake X? <laughs> why Cavi Lake X? Sky Lake X was the one, oh no, you had the 10 core. Yeah, yeah, you didn't have this. Or did you? you d no, you had the... Wasn't this the platform? This is also the platform that had... Uh, you you had to you had to have certain processors to have access to all the PCIe lanes, right? Remember? Yeah. This is the one that you only, like, depending on, on your CPU, you only had access to 28 lanes... And then some other CPUs gave you the full 44 lanes. I think the Cabby Lake X was locked down to only the 28 lanes. And I think if you wanted the full... It doesn't say here, but I'm pretty sure like you only had 28 lanes on the Cabby Lake X. And if you wanted the full 44 lanes, you had to have Sky Lake X. Or something like that. I remember there was something dumb. That was the thing where it's like when then Threadripper came out later that year... And completely demolished um, that kind of business practice that Intel was doing. Like, locking down lanes based on the CPU you had. Like, then, then Threadripper was like, okay. Because remember, Intel was like, Intel was like, okay, with this CPU, you get 24 lanes. But if you want 44 lanes, then you got to go with this CPU. Then Threadripper comes out, and it's like, it doesn't matter what Threadripper CPU you choose, you get the full 64 lanes. <laughs> Ryzen alone destroyed HEDT. I mean, kind of. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, I I understand what you're saying. Cause like the eight core, right? Like the eight core, um, the budget, like what was it? The Ryzen seven six or seventeen hundred was like an eight core sixteen thread for like three hundred fifty dollars. The 1800X was the flagship. That was $500. That was the one that could do like the full turbo and the XFR um, up to like 4.4 uh, or something like that or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, like 3.6 base, 4.0 boost, but then like XFR made it like 4.1 on all core and then 4.2 on like two core or something like that i i know because i had one and I, I remember trying to overclock it and I, and I was 
uh, running RAM at like 3200 megahertz, and people were saying that I was super lucky with my IMC because most people struggle to get 2933 or above. Yeah, 3.6. It was like it was like 3.2 to 3.6 or something like that on the 1700. Why you got a third report? No idea what I was going to use those lanes for, but I figured it out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing with the Threadripper is you never had any kind of limitations. Like, no matter what you wanted to do with the computer, like, you could plug in, you could do SLI, you could do Crossfire, you could do, like, a whole bunch of Gen f Gen 3 NVMe on an add-in card in RAID 0 or RAID 1 or whatever. Uh, like, whatever you threw at it, you could do whatever you wanted, like Threadripper. Threadripper would handle whatever the use case was. That's what I remember about Threadripper. The cores alone back then made it valuable. Yeah. DX12 early days. Uh, discrete, what was it? Um, multi explicit, uh, multi GPU. The thing that no one ever developed and then just kind of died off. Cross vendor. Yeah, I remember that. I remember the NVIDIA and the AMD GPUs. Multi GPU. Yeah. Because you could do you could do fancy stuff like like back then, uh, GPU encoding was terrible. But like if you could do uh, well, you don't actually need multi GPU explicit mode for any of that stuff. But um, yeah, that was a thing. Ashes of Singularity, whatever that one game was that could actually do uh, multi GPU properly it wasn't it wasn't like Battlefield uh, Four or or was it Battlefield One? One of those games like Battlefield or one of the games could actually leverage. Uh, multi-GPU explicit mode properly or something like that. And then, uh, see, part of me thinks, like, when that feature with DX12 came out, then it's like, Crossfire literally died overnight after that feature became a thing. Because, like, AMD's like, oh, this is great. Developers can leverage this. We don't need Crossfire anymore. And, th and then NVIDIA, shortly after that, NVIDIA also started killing off SLI. So, like, like, NVIDIA dragged on, like, NVIDIA held on to SLI way longer than AMD because NVIDIA forced you to buy the SLI adapter, <laughs> the little bridge. <laughs> remember the little bridge? Like, how useless that thing was? Because, like, I remember reading, like, articles where people were running, like, Linux systems and they figured out how to get SLI working over the PCIe bus so you didn't actually need the SLI bridge for the communication. Um... The same, the same way I've I saw people uh, get Threadripper, working or getting Thunderbolt working on Threadripper without like a proper add-in card, like without the actual like five-pin header for the control plane signaling, like stuff like that. Like people kept doing like those kind of weird hacks where they would try to get like SLI working on Nvidia without SLI bridges, or they would try to get uh, Thunderbolt working on Threadripper without any sort of uh, adapter cable for the you know the Thunderbolt protocol you kept a hold of your 780 Ti thinking you'd be able to use it as a dedicated physics card <laughs> hey, that's a good point you know like I'll probably I'll, I, I kept my dual uh, 1080s for the same reason because I kept thinking you know like SLI is dead I mean I have the HBM the high bandwidth bridge the high HBM. The remember how uh, Nvidia, like with the 10 series, Nvidia was like, okay, everybody who has an SLI bridge, you need to buy like a new high bandwidth bridge. Remember that the HBB or whatever they call that thing. And I was like, oh, and I was like, okay, I I have to get one of those now because apparently the one with that came with my motherboard can't do it. But even though it actually can, it's the little like skinny like flexible ones. That can't actually do H high bandwidth. Your bridge had an LED on it. Yeah, mine. Yeah, the, I had the official Nvidia one. It's in my GPU collection video. I think I showed it in the video. I uh, the the way I used to run my SLI setup. So you 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 know how I have an AverMedia capture card because I always talk about AverMedia capture cards. Uh, I used to put the Aver Media card in the the X1 slot between the two GTX 1080s, 
between the bridge. So it, it would be like, uh, it looks kind of like this. So it's it's like, here's the graphics card, or like, like here's the motherboard, and then like the first 1080 would be up here, and then the second 1080 would be down here. And then like in the middle, I would put my Aver Media card for my PS4, and then I would have the bridge like connected between the two. So now it's like the Aver Media was like in between the two uh, 1080s. Like I would stick it between the two of them and then have the bridge like overlaid on top of that. <laughs> so it looked it looked like a, a sandwich. <laughs> it was literally like 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 the two the two 1080s were like the two pieces of bread and the little Aver Media card was like the thing in the middle that you eat. <laughs> I remember trying to do a crossfire on um, Vega 64s. So I had the exact same setup with Vega 64. But the problem with Vega 64 was a like because of that MGPU explicit mode, AMD like literally just forgot about crossfire completely. Uh, so like Vega 64 crossfire was so limited, it, like barely anything actually scaled. And realistically, the very last uh, AMD GPUs that actually had decent crossfire support was the RX 480. And I guess the RX 580. So, like, the Polaris ones were literally the only ones that that actually had crossfire. Uh, decent amount of crossfire profiles where you actually got good scaling. Vega 64 was a huge letdown in that regard because crossfire, like, barely worked on very few games and then i was i was just so disappointed i was like okay dual gpu is dead and then the other problem that i ran into with dual gpu later on was uh you had to be careful what motherboards you bought because uh it was becoming harder and harder to find like motherboards that actually had sli support like typically most motherboards they'll just say oh we support crossfire that's because amd doesn't charge a licensing fee for it but NVIDIA charges for SLI, right? Like, if you want to implement SLI on your NVIDIA graphics card, it's like you have to pay up. So, uh, like, the motherboards have to pay NVIDIA for that. So, I remember the last motherboard that I bought that has NVIDIA SLI support is my X570 Crosshair 8 Hero. From Asus, all the motherboards after that that I have, like they don't have SLI. Like my Z690 with the DDR4 for Alder Lake, that doesn't have SLI, so I can't run my dual 1080s in that motherboard. And then like the one, like this AMD, uh, like the Gigabyte Aorus Master X670E, this doesn't have SLI support. There's literally only, as far as I know, there's literally one motherboard on the am5 platform that supports sli as far as i know it's the 1300 dollar uh msi godlike this is like the only motherboard that has sli support and i guess that's the reason why msi charges 1300 dollars for this motherboard because it's literally the only one that can still do dual gpu for nvidia like, none of the other ones can. There's, like, not a single one. At least on the AMD camp. On the Intel side, I don't even think there is even any of them that supports SLI. Because I couldn't get one for Alder Lake. So I assumed, okay, I can't get one for uh, Raptor Lake either. The other problem, too, is you need a motherboard that has, like, an, X, an X16 uh, and an X8. Otherwise, you know, if, if it doesn't... You're going to be running your GPU through, like, the first GPU is going to go to the CPU, but the second GPU is going to be, like, X4 through the chipset. That's going to be terrible. Terrible scaling, assuming it'll actually work. So. And then, uh, yeah, and that, that's where I'm going with this. So what really, really killed off SLI was when NVIDIA started making, like, 3090 and then now 4090. The cards are so fat that you can't fit two of them together. Nor would you want to, considering how much power consumption they use.
I don't know. Uh, even though SLI and Crossfire is dead, I still like the look of the dual GPU PC. You know what I'm saying? Like the dual GPUs always looked like a true enthusiast setup. Like if you were a real enthusiast, you were running like an SLI or a Crossfire setup. Even if at the end of the day, like very few games that you played actually like used SLI or Crossfire. You just put two of those GPUs in there because it looked cool. <laughs> it was so much money for like so little gain, but it just looked good. <laughs> I I really like the look of like the dual GPU setup. It's that's one thing that it's kind of disappointing that we lost dual GPU. Maybe, who knows, maybe someday, like a decade from now or whatever, when they get to a point where Moore's Law doesn't scale properly anymore and you and you basically have to like get more, uh, like more performance by literally stacking more hardware together, maybe dual GPU will come back someday in the distant future. Like maybe dual GPU will be the way to get proper scaling when you know we're past one nanometer and we're past like angstroms and it's like node shrinks are very very hard to do so the time between node shrinks will be way way longer we're talking like four or five years between a node shrink so the only way to get better performance will be probably you know like dual gpu or maybe dual socket like dual cpus on desktop kind of like dual sockets in servers You remember the Radeon card with the Duel? The 7990? <laughs> oh, the Radeon Pro Duo? The Radeon Pro Duo was like two uh, Fury Xs or something? The, the GTX 690. So the GTX... So the very last one was... Um, hold on, let me pull it up. I, I'll show you guys which one it was. And then we really have to end the stream. So the very last one was the GTX... Titan Z. So here it is in all its glory. This was the last dual GPU from NVIDIA. The GeForce GTX Titan Z. The MSRP on this, it's GK110, which means it is dual GTX 780s. These are two 780s. I think they're 780 or they're 780 Ti. This thing had a launch price of three thousand dollars so everybody complaining about rtx 4090 being like you know 16 to two thousand dollars this thing was in may 28 2014 and it was three thousand dollars dual gpu dual eight pin only one fan you can tell this thing was probably so terribly loud GTX Titan Z. This was the last dual NVIDIA GPU. Um, the very last AMD one was the Radeon Pro Duo. Radeon Pro Duo. Here it is. The very last dual AMD GPU. This one was based off of R9 Fury. It had HBM memory. So it's, it's dual Fury X gpus so remember the fury x was the rival of the gtx 980 tie so this was like two 980 ties but it's amd with the dual like hbm triple eight pin triple eight pin which is kind of a normal thing nowadays strangely enough i remember people thought that was crazy T triple eight pin well i mean there's a lot of gpus that are triple eight pin now it had this it had like water cooling um, you know, it's funny how, like, that standard output configuration hasn't changed. And this has been a while. This thing launched April 26, 2016. So this was, this was like, the, the only GPU that AMD launched in the high-end um, enthusiast class. Like, this was between Fury. Because Fury X was 2015, and Vega 64 was 2017. So this was the GPU that they kind of came up with 
to hold down the fort while they had like nothing to offer. So they just went like two Fury X's and called it a day. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was it. That was the last one. Nvidia Nvidia stopped dual GPU with Titan Z. AMD stopped with Radeon Pro Duo, and that was it. Well, HBM is still in the data center. HBM is a good idea, and it's it's still really good. It's just not uh, cost effective for the consumer market. Yeah, each one of these was four gigs. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah, so it was still only like a four gig frame buffer, but you can see like in intent the real the reality was at 1080p like this was totally fine, like this was not VRAM limited at 1080p back in this time frame, like in this period. But if you wanted to go to like 1440p, no, this this is like the RAM problem would become a thing, and then like especially like 4K, no one would have been gaming at 4K back in 2016, like that's not realistic. So, but yeah, like 1080p, I mean, this is fine. It's just not practical because of, like, the triple eight pin and, you know, the fact that it's dual GPU, so most games don't actually use the second GPU. So, yeah, it aged really poorly because it had the exact same drawbacks that Crossfire has. This is essentially a card that, you know, has to run Crossfire to get that performance bump over a, a regular Fury X. You've been on 1440p since 2012. So I, I moved to 1440p in 2017. And then I moved to 4K last year. So I do kind of think that, yeah, 1440p is still a decent resolution to be on uh, today's standard. But I, I do think, like, the $1,000 GPUs, like the XTX and anything beyond that in terms of price, like the 4090, for instance, like, those are good 4K GPUs. And then even like the 3090 Ti uh, and the 6950 XT and the 7900 XT, all those GPUs and the 4080, those are all decent 4K GPUs. But yeah, they're probably better suited for 1440p if we're talking like long term. Yeah, the, yeah. I feel like the, the 49, well, hmm. The 4090 is better uh, in, in in most cases, right? It's like 15-20% better if we just go off of uh, tech power-ups numbers. What's funny is what I want to know is like where does this thing actually show up in this list? So the, the Radeon Pro Duo... The Radeon Pro Duo only shows up like... The Radeon Pro Duo is like a RX 58, 590. <laughs> so that's... Wow, that's bad. Like Vega is like 38%. Look at this. The XTX. The XTX is 484% faster than the Pro Duo. And then, like, the 4090 is like that. But if we go off of Tech Power Ups numbers, you know, at 4K, you know, 4090 is, like, 22% faster. So that's a pretty, like, that is a decent gap. But, again, you know, like, 22% for 60% more money is, like, mm. That's when that's when it kind of doesn't look so great. <clears throat> but yeah, like th this is where I feel like we're in an era now where 4K is possible with these newer GPUs from both Team Red and Team Green. Technically, I, I kind of think we reached 4K with the previous gen, um, but with all these suboptimal games that launched this year, I'm starting to second guess that uh, conclusion. The lifespan is so short, you'll need a GPU upgrade every one to two years to keep it 4K. Yeah, without sacrificing too much on, on uh, graphic settings, yeah. The XT would be good for 4K. Yeah, it would handle it. Uh, in my review video, I show the results for 4K. It The 700 XT can, can handle 4K in the same manner like an RTX 3090 Ti can handle 4K. See, a lot of people seem to forget... That the 7900 XT is exactly the same as a GTX or a GTX, 
an RTX 3090 Ti. Like, these two cards have the same performance level. They're equivalent. So, a lot of people consider the 3090 Ti, you know, a 4K graphics card. Um, all things considered, 24 gigabytes of VRAM, etc. Um, the the 7900 XT could do the same thing. It's just 20 gigs of VRAM, but same exact rasterization. And it's less power consumption. It's more energy efficient. So, same ray tracing performance too, roughly. We did about the same time the 1080 came out. Technically, 4K is possible with frame skip enabled. That's the thing, you know, I like the whole thing about having to need a new GPU to maintain 4K every one or two years or so. That DLSS 3 frame generation stuff and the AMD FSR 3, whenever that shows up later this year, like those are kind of the features that will sort of help. Uh, maintain the ability to run these GPUs at 4K later on. But again, that's going to be dependent on game support in the future. You ran 4K fine with 980 Ti, needless to say, I probably didn't push it as hard as I do now. With 240 hertz. Oh, well, hold on. 240 hertz, there's no GPU. There's no GPU today that can that can that can do 240 that can max like a 240 hertz panel at 4K. Like n none of these GPUs on this list can do that. You're still gaming in 4K with the 6700 XT, such an underrated card. I'm actually not massively turned off by running it at 1440p. Yeah, because uh, <clears throat> the thing is the pixel density. The pixel density of 4K is, is high enough where if you drop it to 1440, it doesn't look that bad in terms of the scaling, the downscaling, because you're running the non-native resolution on that panel. But because 4K is so dense, it doesn't look that bad. So, yeah. It's kind of like turning on FSR. <clears throat> only only it's not. <laughs> but I, I kind of think that's what FSR 2 and DLSS is supposed to be for. Those features, those upscaling technologies, that's what's going to make these GPUs uh, stay relevant longer, I guess, at the higher resolution. I think that's kind of the whole idea behind them. Um, but anyway, guys, I think that's going to be it for this stream. Um, we'll see. Uh, I, I Like I said earlier, you know, like uh, the X3 stuff is good. If you're, if you're building new, it's really good. Uh, it's going to be the best platform long term. Um, better power efficiency on those 3D CPUs while offering barely any loss in performance at productivity. Um, nothing really noticeable in terms of productivity changes compared to the standard 7950X, but gaming performance is significantly improved to the point where it's like to the tune of like six, six to nine percent better than a a 3900 a 3900K from Intel while consuming significantly less power, typically 100 watts less while gaming. So that means that your room's not going to heat up so much while gaming. So to me, that's a win. That, coupled with the better platform and the upgrade path uh, later on to like Zen 5 and Zen 5 Plus or whatever, um, to me seems like the AM5 platform is kind of a no-brainer, especially if you want to pair it up with one of these graphics cards. Um, but it, it'll become more relevant like, you know, once once RTX 50 series shows up and RDNA 4, assuming those GPUs are going to be PCI Gen 5. So... Um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here, guys. Once again, thank you all for streaming. Or streaming. Thank you all for watching the stream. Um, and I will catch you guys in the next one. Thanks.